Good morning. I'd like to call the Planning Commission to order and ask you to all rise and join me in the flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Can we have the calling of the roll, please? Commissioner Leo Molitor. Present. Commissioner Nora Idukas. Here. Chair Bill Bartels. Present. Vice Chair Richard Rodriguez. Here. Come now to item four, public comments. This is a time set aside for comments by citizens on matters not appearing on the agenda. I have no speaker cards. Seeing none, moving on to item five, approval of the September 11th, 2008 minutes. Commission? Move approval. For the motion? A second. For the motion is second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Moving on, approval of the October 2nd, 2008 minutes. Commission? Move approval. I have a motion. Is there a second? I will second. Motion is second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion approved. Moving on. Item 7, focused update for the Piru Area Plan, GP08-001, etc., etc. Dennis Hawkins. Good morning, Chairman Bartels and members of the Commission. For the record, my name is Dennis Hawkins, staff planner with the Planning Division. If we could get the PowerPoint up there. The matter before you this morning is a focused update to the Piru Area Plan. This includes both a public component filed by Ventura County and three private components filed by applicants John Ryder, uh, Donald Jensen, and Jim Finch. Uh, project includes some 15 different land use entitlements including general plan amendments, zone changes, zone, cha zone ordinance amendment, uh, text amendment, and and of course, uh, track maps and uh, residential plan development permits. The uh, Piru community is a small community of 500 homes in eastern Ventura County. The uh, Piru area of interest is outlined and in, are designated by yellow on this map. This is also the boundary of the Piru area plan. This project is in some ways an outgrowth of the SOAR ordinance, which was adopted by voters in 1998. The uh, SOAR ordinance, as you know, requires that any change in land use designation from agricultural, open space, or rural to a more intense designation requires a vote of the entire countywide electorate, except for a, an area of 62 acres adjacent to the Piru community. The 62-acre area, which is exempt from SOAR, is designated as the Piru Expansion Area in your staff report, and it's highlighted in yellow on the map to the right. Uh, it's no accident that all three private, com private applicants have proposed their development projects within this SOAR-exempt Piru Expansion Area. Uh, the three Piru projects comprise 54 acres, approximately, of the 62 acres. The balance of that area is, is what we call component D. Uh, these are properties owned by private individuals that have not proposed development. Um, the three private projects under the county's general plan uh, processing requirements, uh, general plan amendments have to be screened by the Board of Supervisors to determine whether or not they have sufficient merit to, to be analyzed uh, in detail. Uh, these projects were screened by the board between 1999 and 2004. There were three conditions placed on these permits. All three projects were required to concurrently file all of their land use entitlements associated with their project. Secondly, while the John Ryder project is located within the Piru redevelopment area and is subject to the inclusionary housing requirements uh, of California redevelopment law. The other two projects are outside the redevelopment area. However, the board uh, 
required that both of those projects set aside a, a percentage of their uh, housing units as affordable for affordable families, low-income families. Uh, additionally, all of the applicants were required to participate in the cost of the update to the Paiute Area Plan, and specifically the county staff was directed to prepare a cohesive plan for the entire 62-acre Paiute expansion area. For that 8-acre area that was not uh, part of the private applicants, the Paiute Redevelopment Agency picked up the cost of processing that portion of the redevelopment area of the plan. We met with the Pairu Area Plan Update Committee uh, from January to October of 2004. Uh, the committee is a self-created committee of, of interested citizens, business owners, uh, the applicants, um, uh, public agencies, and members of the Pairu Neighborhood Council. This uh, committee evaluated the entire Pairu Area Plan, looked at the goals, policies, and programs, and made a number of recommendations which are found in, in Exhibit 5.3 of your staff report. Uh, additionally, they provided some guidance for the private developments that uh, have been incorporated into the project. The uh, staff uh, held a public scoping meeting in the Pyru community in uh, De December of 2004 to solicit the uh, input of the community as to what issues ought to be studied in the environmental document. In January of 2005, the board provided uh, more guidance in terms of how much affordable housing the Pyru developers should provide. Uh, ultimately, the developers agreed to set aside 10.5% of their product as affordable for low-income housing units. In addition, in the event that the uh, farm worker housing project in Pyru is constructed, uh, they have the opportunity to pay uh, an in lieu fee instead. This contrasts with uh, Mr. Ryder, who is, because he's located within the redevelopment area, is required to set aside 15% of his housing units for moderate, low, and very low income uh, housing units. The draft EIR was, was presented for public review in, in February of 2006. And in April of 2006, we were able to obtain a grant from the Southern California Association of Governments to hire a private consultant, a Downtown Solutions, who was uh, who put on a community design charrette for the Pyru community. One of the outcomes of this charrette process was this vision poster, which illustrates uh, a number of principles that uh, some of which have been incorporated into the proposed project. The idea of the, the consultant was to try to meld the uh, principles of new urbanism with the agri rural agricultural desires of the community. And the uh, principles that have been incorporated into the proposed projects include the enhanced Main Street, which includes uh, uh, medians and wide parkways, uh, larger than normal setbacks, duplexes that front on Main Street, uh, with access to the garages from the rear. Uh, there is a uh, sports park in the area between the packing plant to the north and the residential area to the south, acting as a buffer. There are also several smaller parks within the residential area that act as a focus for the residential communities. Um, the developers also included a, a wide range of uh, housing types, on various size lots in order to accommodate a, a, a number of different uh, affordability groups and uh, lifestyles. And originally, when this project was proposed, at least on the east side of Main Street, was a, a monocultural single-family development with all very small houses on very small lots, all looking almost identical. Uh, now, if as you'll see in, in the later slides, uh, it's more of a, a mixed community. Uh, another issue that, the, or another recommendation of this consultant was something called uh, cottage cluster, res whoops, that wasn't supposed to happen, Co cottage cluster uh, development, which was a, the consultant's solution to an issue that the developers needed higher density 
um, but the community favored single family residential. And to address this issue, the consultant recommended that where higher density is, is appropriate, uh, the units could be attached or detached, but they'd be located around uh, common open space and they would be designed and articulated in such a way as to resemble as much as possible single family development. Uh, and lastly, the uh, consultant recommended a grid circulation system in order and a system of recreational pathways to, in order to help make this a, a pedestrian friendly environment and to disperse traffic. The uh, principles that were recommended in this plan but not included in the in the project include the uh, uh, provision of a remnant orchard along the at the entrance to the project to help remind the community that of their agricultural heritage the uh, location of uh, several uh, community gardens to give the folks an opportunity to plant I guess vegetable gardens remind them again of their rural agricultural heritage and the provision of nine uh, equestrian lots within the subdivision and an equestrian center uh, which was deemed by the EIR as not practical in this instance uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, immediately after the charrette, uh, Mr. Levy, the, one of the original applicants, dropped out, and Donald Jensen and his partner, Tim Cohen, uh, took his place. All three applicants uh, revised their applications to incorporate the recommendations and EIR mitigation measures uh, within the EIR, and as well as many of the consultant uh, recommendations at the charrette process. In December of 2006, the uh, County's Environmental Report Review Committee recommended that the EIR be certified. This map illustrates the location of each of the public and private components. Uh, the private components are components A, B, and C, uh, and we'll talk about those first. First component, component A, uh, is, was filed by John Ryder. He has a five-acre parcel adjacent to the existing community. It's immediately west of the Fillmore Piru Citrus Association packing plant, which is the community's largest employer. To the north of the project is a, an existing single-family residential tract, and further north of that is a apartment complex of 50 housing units developed at a density of 15 dwelling units to the acre. East of the uh, Ryder property is the United Water Conservation Percolation Basin, and to the south is another single-family residential tract. Further south are the components B and C, private development components of, uh, of this project. The Ryder site is currently essentially vacant, as you can see from the photos. Uh, it does contain one vacant single-family home. The George Maltby House was built in 1911. The EIR indicated that this was uh, potentially a significant historical uh, building. Uh, and the EIR, the, consult, the EIR recommended that the, the building either be retained on site or the applicant had the opportunity to prepare a cultural resources survey and present it to the county's uh, heritage, cultural heritage commission. The uh, commission ultimately Dennis, reviewed the. Uh, Dennis, yes, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but that slide in the right. Haven't all those trees been removed? No, they're still. I believe they're still, they're still there. Still there? Because they were there the last time I was out there. Okay, thank you. Um, at any rate, the, the committee determined that the, the loss of the Maltby House would not result in a significant uh, adverse effect on historic resources. Now, talking about the trees, uh, there are some 16 trees, mature trees, on the Piru, on the Ryder Project. The Piru Area Plan policies require that healthy, mature trees should be retained on site uh, wherever possible. The, consult the applicant submitted a Arborist report, which indicated that all of the trees 
uh, were poorly maintained, and each of them had uh, were either infested with various kinds of pests or disease. Uh, and noted in particular that the uh, Australian silk oak tree, which is the taller tree that you see in the photograph, uh, represented a, a public hazard in that as that tree ages, the branches become very brittle and tend to drop off. Uh, and from that distance and the size of those branches, it could cause some problems. Additionally, the, consult the consultant noted that the uh, site would have to be raised approximately three feet in order to accommodate the uh, requirements of FEMA to protect the site from flooding, and that that change would also have a, a adverse effect on the health of the trees. And for those reasons, the consultant recommended that the trees be removed. However, because some of the trees are of such size that they qualify as heritage trees under the county's tree preservation ordinance, they do still require a permit, and there would be a requirement to mitigate them by planting additional trees, presumably as part of the landscaping of the proposed project. Uh, this slide simply illustrates the surrounding land uses around the Ryder project, uh, the two single-family residential projects north and south, the percolation basin to the east, and the uh, packing plant to the west. Uh, about 300 feet north of the project is the apartment complex that I mentioned, Colina Vista Apartments, about 50 housing units operated by the uh, area-wide housing authority. The writer site plan indicates that uh, he's proposing 49 dwelling units. I'm sorry, yeah, 49 dwelling units. Uh, these units are located around an existing one, or a proposed one-acre park. The park is connected to uh, Main Street, which is on the left side, by means of this landscape paseo, which is 60 some feet wide. Uh, as recommended by the consultant, there are duplexes adjacent to Main Street. Uh, the interior uh, units are duplexes on the north and south side of the park. There's a triplex and a fourplex on the east side of the park, and four fiveplex units on the extreme east end of the project. Altogether, the project has a potential density of 9.8 dwelling units per acre, making it the uh, most intensive of the three privately initiated applicants. The uh, these slides show the uh, elevations of the duplex units. The narrower units on the top are the ones that would be located along Main Street. The wider units would be on the north and south of the, uh, of the park. The triplex and fourplex units would be located at the east end of the park. And the fiveplex units are at the extreme east end of the park. Um, the good thing about these, these units are that they incorporate some of the historical characteristics of the surrounding community. The craftsman architecture is represented by the low, um, the low roofs, uh, exposed rafters, uh, the clapboard and, and shingle siding, and the uh, use of river rock as, a, as an accent and sloping foundations and covered porches. Uh, one of the things that we did note is that these fiveplex units do not seem to comport completely with the consultant's recommendation for uh, cottage cluster residential development, which is, I mentioned a minute ago, requires the units to be articulated and designed in such a way to resemble single family. Uh, we pointed this out to Mr. Ryder, and he was concerned that uh, he'd just lost 14 units in order to accommodate the, the proposed park, and he was concerned about loss of additional units that, that redesign might entail. Uh, his architect also pointed out that the, the units have been uh, painted and, and use of material to separate the units so that you, as much as possible, they do uh, identify the, the separate units. Uh, and secondly, he points out that these units are located at the extreme east end of the project. They're not visible from the public street. Uh, you would basically have to be going to these units as a resident or visitor to even know that they're there. Uh, the cottage cluster concept is a is a uh, is not a standard of the Pyreri plan as recommended. It's a design guideline, and so for those reasons, we simply br bring it to your attention. If you think that the the applicant has, has done a good enough job, you need to do nothing. If you think that these units need to be redesigned to more closely resemble single family, uh, then you would implement or you would 
direct us to implement uh, an alternative mitigation measure, uh, which is uh, in your staff report in Exhibit 14.1, RPD number 9. That would only be implemented uh, if your commission directs it, and if it does, it would require these units to be redesigned, and that redesign would be subject to review by the Piru Neighborhood Council. The next uh, component uh, was filed by Donald Jensen uh, and his partner, Tim Cohen. Uh, this is 16 and a half acres on the east side of Main Street as well, same as uh, Mr. Ryder, only further to the south. Uh, this site is, is south of the Habitat for Humanity single family residential tract. It's also west of the uh, United Water Conservation Percolation Basin. To the south is Highway 126, and south of that is uh, an industrial area. To the west is the uh, Component C, or the Finch Project. Uh, and the area in white that you see on, on the west side of Main Street is three single-family homes that are not proposing development at this point in time. You also see a small enclave on site. It's a tenth of an acre site owned by the Southern California Gas Company, which is used as a metering station for uh, some natural gas lines that run through the area. The site, as you can see from the photographs, is vacant, with the exception, as with Mr. Ryder, with one single-family home. This home, similar to Mr. Ryder's, was built in 1910. Uh, it was substantially remodeled in the 50s, and so it's lost a lot of its architectural integrity. Uh, it was also reviewed by the Cultural Heritage Commission, who found that the loss of this building would not be a significant adverse effect. The surrounding land uses are illustrated by this slide, the Habitat for Humanity Project to the north, Percolation Basin to the east, uh, industrial contractor storage yard to the south, the Finch property and the three single-family homes to the west, and the gas metering station, which is actually an enclave on the east side of Main Street. The Jensen site plan uh, proposes 91 dwelling units total. Uh, there would be 10 triplex units, which are located adjacent to the park and at corner locations. There are four duplex units located along Main Street, as recommended by the Charette consultant. And the balance of the project, uh, there are 53 single-family homes uh, at the interior of the property. Uh, many of the homes are accessed by rear alleys to de-emphasize the automobile dominance of this project. The project also includes a, a small park, just slightly under an acre, uh, and a, an area about three and a I'm sorry, about a uh, 1.3 acres on the south, which is a landscaped area that would be utilized for a stormwater detention facility and a sound barrier. Uh, the sound barrier is necessary to minimize the noise impacts from traffic on Highway 126 uh, and in order to meet the county's noise standards for outdoor noise. Is, this, is that um, section where the berm is going to be constructed? Yes. Um, comparing it to the berm that's off of the 101 in Camarillo, is it about like that? Do you know, are you familiar with that one as you're going? 101 at what location? Um, it's in Camarillo, and it's on the, um, let's see, the southwest side as you're going towards, uh, from, from Camarillo up the grade. I'm not familiar with that. You're not familiar with that? Yeah, sorry. Okay, it's another area in the county yeah. that has a planted berm. Sure. This is... This is an illustration of the area where the berm would be, and there is a, a uh, visual here that the applicant has provided that shows the highway on the east side, the detention basin, and the, the berm, which uh, ranges from 6 to 14 feet in height. Uh, it starts off as a 6-foot structure on the west side at Main Street, uh, reaches about 14 feet in this area, and then wraps around the project on the east side and eventually tapers off to ground level. On top of the berm is a six-foot masonry sump stone wall, uh, so that altogether the, at the high point of the berm it would be up to 20 feet in height. Um, this was identified as a significant adverse unavoidable effect of the project. Uh, however, landscape uh, the applicant has tried to make it. Is the uh, slumpstone wall supposed to have, you know, those vines on it? 
it's landscaped. Uh, I'm not sure this is the conceptual landscape. The program shows that it's heavily landscaped. It doesn't indicate vines. Uh, but and that, it, that could be part of the final design process. It Pardon? Is it articulated as it goes along? Does it um, have columns or architectural details? That it has columns. Um, and as you can see from the, the location of the wall, it's not a straight wall. It follows the contours of, of the property line along the front here. Mm -hmm. So there's some, some interest to it. And the uh, developer, I suppose, can provide you more detail in terms of, of what it would look like, okay, uh, at least you. in terms of his concept. The approval of the, the actual wall requires review by the Piru Neighborhood Council and, and ultimately approval by the, by the planning division. Okay, just um, so that the developer can address this when, when it's their turn to speak. I'm also interested in looking at the um, home's side you know, view of that wall and how high it is. Okay, sure. Thank you. This shows a, a greater detail of the intersection of Highway 126 and Main Street. The applicant is required to uh, provide a dedicated right-hand turn lane uh, off of 126. Uh, this, the landscaping on the west side of Main Street is, is simply an illustration of how this project might tie in with the Finch project on the west side. Dennis? Yes. Excuse me. Um, you want to go back? Uh, yeah, one one slide back, back, please. Well, there you go, perfect. Just this is a, a general comment to applicants and the county. I'm assuming because that's also a truck route, because the major employer is beyond this. Yes. There's some discussion about turning radii and not making what's already a very interesting intersection. Yes, even Public more Works and the Fire Department in particular has, has been quite insistent that proper turning radiuses be maintained. This is a, a view of the uh, Main Street, uh, enhanced Main Street plan as envisioned by the applicants. Uh, what you see here are center medians, uh, eight foot wide parkways, eight foot wide multi-purpose pathways on both sides of the street. As I mentioned earlier, larger than normal setbacks, 25 foot minimum setbacks to the nearest building. Um, and uh, bulb outs at the intersections to both slow traffic and to uh, facilitate better pedestrian access across the streets and making a more pedestrian friendly environment. This slide illustrates the proposed park, uh, which is, I believe, uh, 0.84 acres. Uh, it, includes, it includes both passive and active recreation for both uh, adults and toddlers. It also includes uh, a bus turnout and, and waiting area along Main Street. And uh, it, you can also see the, the bulb outs at this location as well. Both projects include bulb outs as part of their their design. I'm sorry, you were going to say something, Bruce? Another question. Uh, Dennis, could you point out where the gas um, facility would be located? Yeah, the, the gas metering station is immediately south of the park in this area here. It would be fenced and it would be landscaped uh, to uh, protect it from the public use. The housing units proposed by the uh, by Mr. Jensen include uh, ten of these duplex units, uh, which come in several different designs. These are the other designs. Uh, four of these tri uh, duplex units. Did I say duplex before? I meant triplex. Uh, four of these duplex units that would be located along Main Street, and a number of different single-family residential units. The third. Private component is uh, filed by James Finch. He has a 32.4 acre site on the west side of, of Main Street. Uh, the project is bounded by the packing plant to the north, the Habitat for Humanity and the Finch and the Jensen project to the east. Uh, there is an enclave on the west side of Main Street, which I mentioned before, are three single family homes that are not proposing uh, redevelopment at this point. There's a highway commercial area to the south and uh, an existing orchard owned by Mr. Thompson. Uh, and to the west is uh, an agricultural area that would remain in agriculture. 
Uh, that area is also owned by Mr. Finch. The Finch property has a view looking north towards the packing plant uh, from the west side of the property. And this is a, a view from the Main Street uh, looking to the northwest. The buildings that you see in the center of the slide are existing buildings that are located on the property. They include uh, farm worker housing units and storage facilities. Uh, these would be removed. Adjacent uh, land uses are illustrated on this slide, including the, the packing plant to the north, the Jensen site to the east, highway commercial to the south, uh, as well as the Thompson House and, and agricultural orchard, and the continuing agricultural areas to the west. The Finch site plan uh, proposes 175 dwelling units, um, probably the most prominent thing visually is a four acre park, it would be a sports park uh, located adjacent to the packing plant. Um, the project also includes a small mixed use uh, site, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, there are triplexes located west of the park and south of the park, as well as in this area, duplexes along Main Street as recommended. And uh, in the center of the project is an eight acre area that's designated for single-family detached condominium units. And in the center of this area is a private recreational area, uh, which is available for these units. As, and it, there's also a trail system which wraps around the property, uh, both along the west, the north, the east, and, and around the landscaped area to the south. The landscaped area to the south accommodates a, a detention facility as well as decorative entryway landscaping. Uh, the residential area to the south and west of the condominium units are uh, single family traditional units on 4,500 to 5,500 square foot lots. And at the northwest corner of the property are the larger estate housing units, which are on minimum 9,000 square foot lots. Uh, and these are relatively large housing units. Altogether, the uh, Finch project is uh, 5.4 dwelling units per acre, which is almost the same as the Jensen project, which was 5.5 dwelling units per acre. This is simply a detail of the proposed sports park. Uh, what you notice the multi, uh, the triplexes, the mixed use commercial and uh, condominium uses here, the uh, single family condominium uses, and the, of course, the packing plant to the north. On the east side is the uh, uh, Habitat for Humanity project. I see. Are there plans to have that lit? The park? Yeah. This is a conceptual drawing that the, those details haven't been determined yet. This slide is intended to illustrate the uh, proposed uh, agricultural buffer, which is be at the west end of the project. Uh, it includes a multi-purpose recreational trail, which... Uh, Excuse me. Here. Yes. I have a question, going back to uh, Commissioner Dugas's comment. Um, this is all conceptual, uh, yet we have a lot of detail here. As it relates to that park, when is that, uh, that uh, particular portion of the parcel are going to be expounded on to the provide the The conditions require that the park be reviewed and approved by the County Parks Department. Uh, also reviewed by the Neighborhood Council. So it'll become final at, at that point. Okay. My concern, obviously, and I think our, our, our focus is, is the issue of lighting and in this particular case, potential public safety issues. Sure. And so if not here, then who and when will the potential lighting issue uh, uh, be reviewed? That'll be up to the, the County Parks Department to determine okay, thank you. You know whether or not the park is safely lit or not. Uh, this also shows a, uh, a landscape paseo which connects from the exterior uh, pathway system to the uh, interior recreation area within the condominium site. And what you notice is they've used uh, mid-block bulb outs to help make the pedestrian crossing a little bit easier. Uh, another view of the uh, Paseo, landscape Paseo system. 
Uh, this is the area to the southeast of the uh, project, including the entryway landscape area along Main Street, which includes a another bus turnout and a covered parking a covered waiting area. And the uh, landscaped area to the south is a uh, detention basin with a pathway that runs around the entire area. The housing units you see to the to the north here are the single family traditional units. Um, this is just another view of the uh, interior Paseo system. Oops, you seem to be going the wrong direction. Uh, this is, uh, shows uh, where the Paseo system and the uh, interior private recreation area come together. And this slide shows the uh, proposed mixed use site. Uh, the concept here is uh, 8,500 square feet of ground floor commercial and on the top floor would be six condominium units. The commercial is accessed, obviously, from Main Street. The, commercial, the residential units are accessed uh, from the west side. You can just see the, uh, uh, what is it, the, the landing area over there where the residential units have some, a uh, little bit of open space available to them. But the, the concept is to try to separate the, the two uses a, a bit to minimize the uh, potential conflicts between residential and commercial uses. I point out that mixed use development is not allowed by the county zoning ordinance at the present time. The Pirary Plan update, com uh, update Committee had recommended that we prepare an ordinance to allow uh, mixed use development within the Piru commercial downtown area. Uh, and we have done that. It's in Exhibit 7 in your staff report. Uh, it would also be necessary to approve that amendment in order to approve this mixed use site on the pinch property. Could you tell me why it's not allowed? The county ordinance is a traditional ordinance based on the idea that land uses need to be separated in order to protect them from potential incompatibility. Um, under the current new urbanism philosophy, the idea is you try to bring residential and commercial together. You take care of the uh, potential incompatibility through design rather than physical separation. And is there a height limit on um, this portion of, of the project? How, uh, how well, tall the height that? limit would be the same as the commercial zone, whatever whatever that is. I think that's 75 feet. 75? I mean, what, is, what is the height limit on a CPD zone? <coughs> Sorry. We don't have. It would be whatever, the, whatever it is for commercial. But the use itself requires a, a Okay, what is that? Because 75 feet is considerably more than two stories. Yeah, maybe <laughs> the question is we'll, we'll come back. We'll come back. We'll look it up and let you know. Sorry. Thank you. I'm interested. I was in guessing that. at 75 feet. Well, irrespective of what the ordinance would allow, what is being proposed and what is being sought for approval is this, not 75 feet. Right. So. But um, I, I, I'm still interested in what the height limit is and, and whether or not we're going to have two stories or whether. Um, it will be more intense than that. Good um, point. I just, um, it'll help me. Okay. Sorry, I don't have that on the tip of my tongue. You also see the uh, the site plan for the mixed use site. It includes two parking areas that would serve not only the commercial but also as visitor parking for the residential area. Uh, Mr. Finch proposes, uh, I believe, six triplex units. Uh, as we noted, we located west, of, west and south of the park and along Main Street, or west of Main Street. He proposes two duplex units adjacent to uh, Main Street and a variety of single-family homes, single-family detached units. The top row of housing units are the uh, interior single-family condominium units. This would be the smallest units on the, on the project, but also for the entire Piru expansion area as little as uh, 973 square feet. The housing units on the south are the single family estate units, which are the largest units uh, within the project area, and up to 3,750 some square feet in size. The center row are the single family traditional units that would be located to the west and to the south of the um, condominium units. Component D, uh, as you remember, the the, the three projects make up 54 acres or so of the 62 acres. Component D is the leftover eight acres owned by uh, several different property owners. 
None of these applicants have proposed urban development, but the Board of Supervisors directed that we prepare a, a cohesive plan for the entire area. Uh, the largest parcel is component, uh, this parcel here on the southwest corner, owned by Mr. Thompson. It's currently developed as an agricultural orchard and a single-family home. The parcel immediately to the east of that is is uh, Risman Water Company, water well. Uh, the uh, parcel along West Main Street we've described before as having three single-family homes on it, and the small parcel on the uh, uh, Jensen Project is is a, an existing Southern California Gas Company uh, metering station. The Component D area co includes four existing single-family homes, uh, including the Thompson property, Thompson residence on the south of uh, the lower left-hand corner, and three uh, single-family homes on the west side of Main Street. The other land uses uh, within Component D include the water well on the Risman property, the gas company metering station, and of course the Thompson Orchard. As we said, the, uh, the direction from the board was to come up with a cohesive plan for the entire area. Uh, this is our attempt at doing so. This would be a part of the Piru area plan. And the land use designations that you see here would basically reflect those that are currently proposed by the three ap private applicants. For component D, uh, the area west of Main Street would be designated as as uh, as uh, the Main Street Promenade area, which calls for large large lots that could be developed with duplexes. Uh, to do so, the three property owners, if they wish to, uh, could simply extend the alley system, which is proposed by Mr. Uh, Finch. The Thompson property on the southwest corner would be Main Street Promenade along Pacific Avenue and on the interior lots would be large lot single family with a small uh, focus park. Uh, the property just to the east, which is currently a water well, would be redesignated as commercial to be consistent with the surrounding commercial uses adjacent to it. And the uh, gas company site would be designated as community facility. Could I interrupt you for sure. a minute again? Um, could you go back to that? Where is the agricultural buffer area? Where's the area that's going to be um, agriculture, and where will the buffer? The uh, area west. The, uh, the Finch. The area yeah. west of, of the Finch component is existing agriculture that would remain designated as agriculture. The buffer is this area right along here. That's it. Right. Uh, the it should be noted that the Thompson property is also in agriculture now, but it would be designated as, as urban if this project is approved. And therefore, it's not necessary or not required to put a, uh, an agricultural buffer. So where would the agricultural buffer be um, required? The agricultural buffer would be between the proposed residential. Could you just do it with the, with sure. the red light? And how wide is that? It's between 150 and 300 feet. In this case, it's I think it's a 300-foot buffer. Okay, thank you. I, I'm sorry, I need a clarification on those comments. You say the buffer is 300 feet wide, which I, is 100 yards. Well, if if you include the, I, I'm speaking specifically right, what, on, on the west. The, on the, the, the physical landscape portion of the buffer is less than that. Uh, the landscape portion, I don't remember what the what the width is, but it also includes. If I can get back there, the landscape portion is a, is a part of the buffer. It's it's part of the uh, there, but also the road counts as part of the buffer. Also, the the setbacks on the residential area counts as part of the buffer. So I'm I'm not sure exactly how wide the uh, uh, the landscape area is that's shown on here, but there would be a a, a landscape setback as well as a uh, uh, chain link fence along that area. So when you, when your comments say that there's a, um, would you say 300 foot buffer? That's from your front door or the westernmost portion of the structure to the property line west of the structures. That's correct. Um, is there a is there a? I realize there's a a uh, pedestrian trail or bike path on the west side. Is there any uh, block wall 
perimeter in addition to that? Uh, or is there any sort of raised elevation to uh, create uh, a buffer issue or supplement the buffer issue? No, the requirement was to have a uh, vegetative uh, barrier between the two properties. My, the reason not, a, not, a, not a masonry barrier. Not a sound wall type situation. Not a sound wall. Well, my, and, and that's understandable. My c comments and concerns are because it is up against a, an agricultural uh, buffer, agricultural being what it is, and um, cultivation and spraying, etc., being what they are, prevailing winds being what they are, is that landscaping identifies sufficient to mitigate spillover from the agriculture. The requirements and for the vegetative barrier have to do with the, the amount of leaf coverage and so forth. Uh, the standards are in the, 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 in, in, uh, the conditions in, in Exhibit 14.3, but uh, they were developed by the, by the uh, Agricultural Commissioner's Office to try to assure that there would be um, capture of any pesticides and, and so forth that uh, might be oversprayed. Okay, as I, as I labor through this EIR and this associated report, I don't recall specifically what the comments were about the ag portion of it, but we can we can certainly look at it later on in the presentation. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it should be pointed out that Mr. Finch is the, also the adjoining landowner on both sides, and uh, one of the requirements is that they he may have to basically grant himself a, an easement for for that to, to affect the practices on the west side. So the buffer zone would include <coughs> potentially an easement to continue to to farm the property west of yeah, the, this he, he may have to restrict his cultural practices uh, adjacent to that that uh, landscaped area. Uh, let me correct that. It would not be an easement. You can't grant an easement to yourself. It would have to be in the form of a restrictive, I mean, a covenant. Covenant to property. Land. Okay. It would modify his cultural practices so as not to have an adverse effect. Right. Okay, thank you. Anything else before I go on? Will there be a chain link fence? With there will be an eight foot chain link Thank fence. You. Well, it's, I seem to be a little fast on the trigger here. Component E uh, is a half acre Heritage Valley End site located at the southwest corner of Main Street and Center Street, uh, currently developed with a hotel and restaurant. The property is currently zoned commercial. Uh, but it's designated as hotel on the Piru area plan. Uh, under the hotel designation, the only land uses permitted are hotels, motels, and boarding houses. Uh, the Piru area plan update committee had recommended that we redesignate this from hotel to commercial to provide uh, more opportunities to use this property, which is a designated uh, heritage site uh, by the county. Uh, if it were rezoned, it could be used for such things as as dining establishments, uh, commercial retail, uh, personal service uses, and so forth. Uh, the surrounding land uses are primarily residential to the north, west, and south, uh, but it is adjoining the commercial business district to the east, and it is in included within the community business district uh, overlay zone at the present time. The remaining public component is component F. Uh, component F is essentially a housekeeping uh, recommendation. Uh, it has no effect on the proposed land uses within these sites. Under the county general plan, uh, existing community designated areas are, are for areas that are already developed with urban land uses but are not connected to an existing urban center. If your commission and the board ultimately approves an expansion of the Piru urban community to include components A, B, C, and D, then these areas would then be contiguous and part of the larger Piru urban center. And our recommendation would be to recognize that and uh, make this part of, make these four properties urban. Uh, these properties include the uh, Habitat for Humanity property uh, adjacent to uh, the Ryder and Jensen properties and uh, commercial and residential designated areas along Highway 126. 
um, Habitat for Humanity tract is a 29-lot subdivision, uh, basically constructed by the homeowners themselves and, and their friends, uh, the industrial areas along uh, Highway 126 and the highway commercial area uh, adjacent to Main Street on Highway 126. The, uh, in order to approve a general plan amendment, uh, we suggest that uh, you weigh some of the positive and negative aspects of the project. We note that the project uh, will generate about 35 housing units that would be affordable to uh, moderate, low, and very low income housing families. Uh, the project would provide uh, bus turnouts and waiting areas and would generate uh, $213,000 or so in in uh, air quality fees that would be used to improve uh, local public transit and ride-sharing opportunities for the community. Uh, the project would provide about six acres of, of new parkland plus uh, one and a half miles of linear uh, multi-purpose pathways. Uh, the project would result in uh, about $289,000 in traffic impact mitigation fees that would go towards making road improvements and pedestrian improvements within the Piru community to address safety issues that already exist within the community that uh, uh, the applicant would help to uh, address. As we mentioned earlier, the project includes uh, enhanced Main Street concept, which includes uh, additional landscaping along Main Street, parkways and center medians, uh, pedestrian activated signal crossings to facilitate uh, uh, pedestrian friendly environment. The project would generate uh, through the oh, $213,000, I think, in $232,000 in fees that would uh, allow for the expansion and improvement of the Piru Library. Uh, the pi project, as proposed, would result in the creation of a new uh, uh, improvement district that would uh, fund enhanced sheriff's facilities provide about $72,000 per year in uh, augmented uh, law enforcement services for the community. And the project would generate about $16,000 uh, that would go to the uh, American Red Cross that would be put into a dedicated fund to be used for Piru to pay for emergency shelter supplies, uh, storage facility, and provi would provide for periodic training for the community to deal with uh, emergencies such as fire, flood, and earthquakes that uh, periodically affect the community. On the... Dennis, if I can interrupt sure. there for a second. The, the traffic impact fee and some of the other fees, those are one-time fees? Correct. Okay. The exception would be the, the, the sheriff facility fee, which would be paid annually. <laughs> the uh, adverse side of the, the picture would be the loss, the permanent loss of uh, about 62 acres of, of prime farmland, which would be replaced by urban land uses. Uh, during the construction phase of the project, uh, there's expected to be nuisance impacts due to noise on the uh, nearby residences. As we mentioned, the uh, sound wall uh, barrier along Highway 126, uh, however, landscape uh, may be perceived as a significant visual impact uh, for folks. And uh, at present time, the community is separated from Highway 126 by about a quarter mile of existing uh, open space agricultural land uses. This project would convert that to an urban land use, and some Piru residents have expressed that that would uh, result in a significant adverse effect on, on community character for the community. Could I jump in there? You bet. Uh, what about air quality impacts? Project would generate air quality impacts primarily as a result of uh, each housing unit having two or more cars associated with it. Uh, there are a number of air, air quality mitigation measures, but the primary one, uh, because they can't be fully mitigated, would be payment of a, uh, of a fee that would go towards the uh, uh, public transit and, and ride sharing programs within the community. Were the um, air quality impacts um, deemed to be significant and that was the mitigation for them? The air quality impacts were deemed to be significant but mitigatable through 
the well, program offered uh, by the payment of TDM fees, as well as requiring uh, certain air quality mitigation measures in terms of, of building the houses and so forth. They have to do a, um, I don't remember what they were required to do. They had to put in like solar roofing as a, as a, uh, on the model homes to show that the developers, the, the homeowners would have the opportunity to purchase them for their own housing units, for example. Is there another level of review where these, uh, I don't know, is it South Coast Air Quality? I don't know. Is there is there a board that would look at those specifically those those impacts, or is this it? No, this the mitigation fee would be paid. Uh, the the Air Pollution Control District and the Planning Division together would determine how those funds would be expended. I see. Thank you. In the view Excuse of the me. Planning Division. Excuse me. Can you go back a slide? Sure bet. Oops. No. It's gone too far, huh? Forward one. Put a fork in it right there. Um, would you comment on the enhanced public safety services? The sheriff services? Correct. Yeah. Okay. I, we're actually okay. going to talk about that later, but okay, talk that, about it now. Well, that's, that's fine. fine. I'll, I'll hold my comments or my questions until okay. that point. Okay. Because that is an unusual request that requires some specific concept discussion. Uh, the recommendations, um, assuming that you, if, if, if you agree with the staff conclusion that uh, the benefits outweigh the adverse consequences, we first recommend that, that you defer your approval authority on the residential plan development permits uh, to the Board of Supervisors. This is allowed by the zoning ordinance in the instance where multiple entitlements are required and some of those entitlements require board approval, as in this case. Uh, secondly, it's recommended that the board certify the final EIR, which is in your packet as Exhibit 12, adopt the CEQA findings, mitigation measures, and the Statement of Overriding Considerations, which is Exhibit 13 in your uh, staff report packet, and adopt the Mitigation Monitoring Program, which is incorporated into, into Exhibit 14. Uh, we suggest that the board make the findings found in various places within the staff report and approve the general plan amendments, the zone changes, the zoning ordinance text amendment, and the three private uh, track maps and residential plan development permits, as well as the, the mixed-use development permit for the Finch project. And now, as, as you were asked before, we have two special recommendations that are unique to this project. One has to do with the uh, requirement that the, or the recommendation that the board authorize the use of Melarus as community facilities district as a method of financing long-term uh, enhanced law enforcement services for the community. Uh, the law enforcement services are provided by the sheriff's department. Uh, the sheriff's department has a standard which they try to maintain in the county of one patrol officer for every 1,270 persons. Uh, the EIR indicated that the project and cumulative development would exceed this standard, and the uh, Sheriff's Department recommended a finding of significant impact. The cost of a uh, Sheriff's Patrol officer is estimated to be $189,000 per year. However, the project itself generates revenue in terms of property taxes and sales tax, which uh, covers slightly more than half of that. Uh, the Residual is about $72,000 a year, uh, which the Sheriff's Department finds is a cumulative significant impact. The EIR recommends as a mitigation measure uh, that a special district be created to finance that deficit. Um, we, uh, we point out that a, a Mellow Roost District is, is probably the most feasible of the various alternatives that are available for financing. Um, but we do note that the County Board of Supervisors has, has in the past not approved Melrose districts as long as there are opportunities for private financing or if, uh, at, and only if in a situation where there is a significant public benefit to formation. And the reason the Board is reluctant to approve Melrose is because the Melrose bonds have the County's name on it. While the county has no legal obligation to pay back the bonds in the case of a failure, the case of a failure would 
have an adverse effect on the county's bond credit rating, which could affect then the cost of borrowing by the county. Uh, so that is the negative side. Dennis, yes. Current population of the existing community. Uh, seventeen hundred and something. Okay, and and we're proposing to add how many people? Eleven hundred and something. Okay. So the addition of this eleven hundred people, and and is the the level of service for the existing community adequate, or is there are a lot of special task forcing for the existing community currently with public services required. The community believes that their level of service is below standard. Uh, okay. The Sheriff's Department indicates that they have basically standard coverage in Piru, which means that they have one dedicated patrol officer that, that uh, monitors the entire area east of Fillmore. Uh, the community says that amounts to a, a drive-through once a day to Piru Lake and back, and of course, response to 9-11. Sheriff's Department says that the community uh, has a large number of at-risk children uh, use, and almost no recreation opportunities for these at-risk use. And the community has a small but growing gang problem, which is uh, becoming a concern to the Sheriff's Department. And for those reasons, they believe that there is a significant public benefit uh, to providing enhanced services. I should point out that the one of the applicants, uh, Mr. Finch, has objected to this requirement. And his objections are that the, uh, the cost of this, which is estimated to be about $230 for each dwelling unit or each family that will move into this project, uh, would have a financial impact on the marketability of his project. He also points out that it's inherently unfair in his mind that, that the new development would pay for a, a service which would be equally as beneficial to the existing residents of the community. Uh, and thirdly, he points out that the Sheriff's Department is relatively well-funded. They receive uh, $23.2 million a year in uh, Proposition 100, 172 funds, uh, which are provided to provide enhanced law enforcement services uh, countywide. And of course, a portion of that uh, is reflected in the service offered to uh, Piru. Uh, the Sheriff's Department says that on the other hand, Piru, these developments aren't going to be contributing to that state fund. Uh, and those funds are provide services countywide. Uh, it's not simply a reallocation of services, a reallocation of revenue, but you basically would have to decrease services or, or uh, in one part of the county to, to benefit uh, the Piru community. And if you want a specific law enforcement enforcement effort dedicated to the Piru community, you have to identify a specific fund, funding source for that. So just in a broad brush, it sounds like there are some major policy issues yes. far beyond the scope of the Planning Commission that are in play here? Yes. Just the checking. Board of Supervisors will definitely have to weigh in on, on the issues with two separate bodies. I'd like to, I'd like to piggyback. Are you finished? Sure. Um, where did this population figure come from, 1,700 existing residents there? Uh, the 2000 census plus uh, new building permits that have been issued since okay. 2000. I will disclose some of the... I'm sorry? I, I will disclose during disclosure in my meeting with some of the residents in the community. And they told me to drive through the Habitat for Humanity he's dwellings because there are their contention that there are two two or three families living in those dwellings, plus the fact there are, he's just, just look at the number of cars, automobiles. It, it's my impression that there are more than, than that, those people, and I don't know what census could be taken, but this would, in, this would raise the number of people and, and help mitigate the cost of the sheriff. And also, it's their impression that with this, with this new housing, some of the some of the housing may contain many more people. Anyway, it's just a it's just a perception. Have a higher higher than average population per household than anywhere else in the county. Uh, the average in the 2000 census was 3.66 persons per household, whereas the countywide average is closer to three. Um, so yeah, there is higher and farm worker housing. As you know, the Cabrillo project is approved has a at least in the 
and the Sesame Farm Hacker Housing Project has like five persons per housing unit, much higher. And I, I can't speak to Habitat for Humanity because that was post 2000 census. Um, but I, I don't it, doubt the, the it, information that you're providing. Yeah, it's just something to uh, uh, consider, but thank uh, you. Uh, the second uh, unique recommendation of this project has to do with the uh, funding of parks, local parks. Uh, the recommendation would be that uh, the Board of Supervisors direct the Parks Department uh, to take a second look at the Quimby Ordinance and to evaluate funding of local parks uh, to ensure that there's adequate funds for operation and maintenance of local parks. Um, this came up during the, our meetings with the Piute Area Plan Update Committee. Uh, one of the first things they said to us is that they wanted, if, if they had to if they had to tolerate this, this new development in their community, they at least wanted a real park as opposed to a hypothetical park. Um, and the way that came about is, is over the past 12 or 15 years, the county has approved some 200 dwelling units within the Piru community um, that should have resulted in two and a half acres of new parkland for the community, but in fact did not. Um, and we sat down with the parks department to discuss some of the issues that prevented that from happening. And what we found is there's several fatal flaws uh, in the county's park funding program. Uh, first, understand that the Quimby ordinance is set up in such a way uh, that its intent is that as small developments occur, each developer would pay its proportionate share of, of the cost of purchasing parkland and uh, improving the park uh, at the time they're approved. Uh, and the idea is that as development occurs over time, when enough development occurs, the Parks Department would dip into these savings to, to purchase a new park, uh, and the community would, would benefit from it in that way. In practice, it doesn't happen. Uh, first, when the, at the time the money is collected, the value of the land is whatever it was, uh, but the value of that land increases at a much faster rate than the, the county savings. Uh, so if, if we're getting 3% interest on our money that we saved and the land is going up 15% a year, over time there's less and less ability to provide parkland. Secondly, uh, even if the land values were stable and the county had enough money to spend it, what, what happens in practice is that because the county is uh, so underfunded in terms of maintenance and operations of parks, it's inclined to use the, those funds uh, to backfill the existing parks. For example, the Quimby funds were used to give uh, Waring Park a, a makeover. They got new lighting, new bathrooms, and so forth. Uh, but there's no land, no money available now for, for expanding the parks. Uh, thirdly, um, because funding of local parks comes out of the budget and enterprise funds, it's very limited. Any new parks that the, the county should acquire become then a burden on the existing parks because the same amount of money has to be spread out over a larger area so that there would be a deterioration of park maintenance countywide. And finally, uh, the board has apparently adopted a policy uh, and directed it towards the park department that says that no new public park should be created unless they're fully revenue offset. Well, that can work for a regional park because you can put in a golf course or a recreational vehicle park or amphitheater or whatnot, but with a local park until somebody invents a, a coin-operated picnic table or a playground equipment, it, it simply doesn't work. And even if it did work, it probably wouldn't be a good idea. Uh, so that effectively means that the Parks Department is in a position where they're not funded in such a way that they would promote new parks. And even if they could, it would run against board policy. So what we're asking is that you Direct, uh, ask the board to rethink that and decide whether or not we really want local parks in, in Ventura County. The long-term consequences is that the park acreage per population is growing. Uh, in Piru, in Piru, the the the, require, the recommendation is is uh, five acres per thousand population. Based on the existing population, there should be about 11 acres of parkland in Piru. We have about five acres now, um, and I guess that's being mirrored around the county, I presume. Uh, 
There's also an existing park that was constructed by the Pairu Redevelopment Area. It's a one-acre park in the downtown area, Pairu Town Square Park. It was, it was constructed by the redevelopment agency. Parks Department said, no, we can't maintain it. So it's currently being maintained by the redevelopment agency, which is just fine for right now. But the redevelopment agency has a sunset clause. It goes away in, uh, I believe, the year 2015. At that point, there will be no funds for maintaining this existing park uh, unless something is done about it. So we're asking that the Parks Department take a look at those issues and, and try to come up with solutions. For this project, the solution that we came up with, not perfect, but each of the developers will dedicate the land for a new park. They'll be maintained, they will develop the new park, and the, the parks will be maintained by the Homeowners Association. That works kind of because these are relatively large projects, but if these were 10 lot subdivisions, uh, they'd be very small parks. So would the uh, population in, in Piru be welcome at these parks? These yes. sound like private parks. The requirement would be that these parks would be operated as if they were public. Uh -huh. The public would be invited. And you notice that all of the parks are, are located adjacent to Main Street or would have access. At the edge. Right. Um, so all of the all of the comments that, um, I don't know how to pronounce his name, Andy Yoshida, in his uh, uh, email to you in February 2006 where he was talking about um, uh, maintenance and and he says let's make sure it's not another Piru railroad depot is that what you were talking about that was yeah. the uh, that was a park that was constructed okay. the thought was it would be maintained by the parks department until they actually talked to the parks department and said nope not going to happen so the homeowners association is responsible for all those paseos and the uh, that's correct and uh, the park and, okay and a public park yes This slide uh, is, is simply a visual to show you how the general plan designations would change. The Pyra expansion area and the existing community areas would change from agricultural and existing community to urban. The Pyra area plan would change. Uh, the Heritage Valley Insight would change from hotel to commercial. The Pyra expansion area would change to a variety of uh, land use designations indicated on the on the inset map to the right. Um, and the zoning would change within the Piru expansion area from agricultural exclusive to RPD 10 units of the acre on the Ryder project and RPD 6 units of the acre on the Jensen and Finch projects and the uh, component D portion of the Piru expansion area with two exceptions. One is the, the mixed use site on the Finch property. Whoops. Uh, which uh, would be redesignated to uh, commercial plan development, community business district overlay in order to accommodate that mixed use uh, proposal of his. And the uh, Risman Water Company site, which is located adjacent uh, to the existing uh, commercial zoned area to the east, would be rezoned to commercial or redesignated as commercial. Uh, and this map was intended to just be there available in case there were. Uh, in case you needed to refer to them during the hearing. Uh, we received one communication from Kimberly Rivers, uh, who has expressed opposition to the proposed private developments. The Piru Neighborhood Council is the board authorized public review group out in Piru. Uh, about a year ago, they submitted uh, their formal response to these projects, uh, which indicated that they had unwavering opposition to these projects. I understand that that may have changed a little bit, but they haven't given us any indication of how how that's changed. Um, uh, they also recommended that uh, the projects be redesigned at a much lower density. And that concludes Excuse the staff presentation, unless there are additional questions at this time. Um, is there a representative of that group here today? Pardon the Neighborhood Council? Correct. I'm here on behalf of Janet McDonald. She's the president. Okay, thank you. Like thank you. Okay, um, before, before um, there was a question from the commission relative to the height limits in the CPD zone. We were in error. It's actually 35 feet. However, there's a provision that with a CUP, 
an applicant could ask to go as high as 60 feet. But in this case, the limitation is 35 feet. Also, I is, also that, is that uh, an average um, roof height of 35, or is that an absolute limit? And is the 60 an absolute, or is it an average? <laughs> That's what we do in TO. We average it. Well, it depends on the roof type. If it's a flat roof, it's 35 feet to the top. If it's a pitched roof, it is the average of the pitch. Okay, but it, um, uh, one thing that uh, the city where I'm from, I'm familiar with, is is averaging roofing heights so that you know one section can be uh, much higher than the limit, 35. And as long as there's a, a section of the building that is, you know, that offsets it so that the number comes out. Is that something that... We don't do that do? type of averaging. Uh, we would have to do a more comprehensive amendment to the CPD zone or any of the other zones to accommodate that concept. Thank you. I'd like to, uh, knowing that there is a letter that's going to get read, if we could get copies of that letter, it makes it much easier to um, have it so perhaps the, we could borrow it and go ahead, Commissioner Dukas. I'm sorry. I'm yeah, sorry. No, go ahead. Um, I did want to ask about uh, water and uh, the questions about uh, the, the pumping that were raised and, and how that was resolved. And uh, Okay. Um, water service to the Pirate community is provided by Waring Water Company. It's a private water company. Uh, they obtain their water from three water wells pull out groundwater from the Piru Basin. The Piru Basin has historically uh, had a, has groundwater levels that are rising over the past 15 or 20 years. Uh, and the water district says that they have plenty of water uh, to serve this project. What they have a shortage of is water storage. Uh, they have, I think, a single storage tank, which they indicate is, is uh, near capacity and, and poses a potential problem during peak summer months when uh, uh, when people are out watering their lawns and so forth. What they say they need is a new water storage tank, and they say they have designed their connection fees in such a way that the new development would pay for that second storage tank. Does that respond and, to your and question? What about, and what about the uh, impacts, the indirect impacts that were raised in Oxnard? Right. Uh, the uh, Box Canyon Aquifer, downstream from this project, uh, receives overflow from the Piru Basin. Uh, the Fox Canyon District, or actually the Public Works Agency acting on their behalf, responded that the project would have a potentially significant downstream cumulative effect uh, because by to the extent that this project reduces water that might otherwise flow downstream, uh, it would not be available to replenish the Fox Canyon uh, aquifer. Uh, mitigation measures are that the applicants are required to uh, compensate that for that by uh, adopting a water conservation plan or other means that would result in a no net loss of, of groundwater uh, to the Fox Canyon Aquifer. And uh, each of the applicants have indicated they intend to do a, a water conservation plan that they think will accommodate that. But that has to be approved by the Public Works Agency to assure that there, there is no net loss. And also, has the Agricultural Commissioner, commissioner weighed in on this um, plan? The Agricultural commissioner, commissioner reviewed the project and recommended that the, with the mitigation measures that are proposed, uh, including the agricultural buffer and the requirement to circulate a uh, right to farm ordinance to the future homeowners, that he's satisfied that the project addresses his concerns. Thank you. You're welcome. I would propose, um, it being at the end of the staff report, we take a short break. And then uh, I have four speaker cards. And if there are other people wishing to speak, if you could make them available. Um, Mr. Finch, just as the chair, I have some specific questions for you that were represented by the planning department. So I would appreciate it if you would make yourself available. I think all the applicants Okay. Um, and then also I have a speaker card from Mike Namez. I may have tortured that name and I apologize. 
Are you supporting or uh, this action or? Supporting it. Thank you. So we will take a five minute break and come back and open the public.
Are we ready? Do you want? Do you need to? Let's just in terms of how we go from here, we've had the presentation of the staff report about to have disclosures by the commissioners then there will be questions of the staff by the commission I think many of those questions have already been posed and then presentation by the applicant in this case it is a nebulous set of applicants I have speaker cards but we'll get through that piece presentation by persons in favor of the requested action presentation by persons in opposition of the requested action and then rebuttal by applicant and staff, because staff in this case is also part of the applicant. So moving to disclosures by the commission. At this time, I would like to ask each planning commissioner to state on the record whether or not he or she has received any oral or written ex parte communication regarding this agenda item that is not already contained in the record before us on this matter please disclose the substance of that information only if that information is not contained in the record before us on this matter. Conditioner, Commissioner Dukas? None. Commissioner Rodriguez? Including our familiarity with the area I'm visiting. That kind of, unless County Council says otherwise, that kind of goes with the territory. Yeah. Um, I'm very familiar with the area and have been for over 30 years uh, through the course of my employment. Um, um, I've looked at the at the proposal um, um, using my computer at home, using Google. I've uh, to get a, a good overview of the entire area. Um, I also uh, um, conducted uh, uh, talked to. I went out to the site and I've looked at the various parcels that are presented here uh, just to refresh my memory because it's been it's been a few years since I physically have gone through Pyro. I needed to get a grasp of uh, of the location, uh, reacquaint myself with the location of the resident of the school in the area as it relates to since it's brought up in the staff report as uh, an evacuation point for emergencies. Um, I also was uh, was intrigued by the cost of the law enforcement uh, services that are uh, that are issued or that are represented in the uh, staff report. Uh, uh, One hundred eighty nine thousand dollars that was identified and what that represented. Um, and the reason for that is because uh, in my previous life, uh, 
having retired as a chief deputy of the sheriff, uh, one of the things I did was administer the sheriff's budget, including all the sheriff's contract methodology, uh, both uh, constructing it and overseeing it. Um, and so I'm intimately familiar with cost issues, and, and I wanted to obtain an understanding of what exactly the $189,000 represented and what it did not represent. Um, so in that regard, I contacted the stationary captain, Tim Hagel, um, to confirm some thoughts and to get a clarification on cost, if he could provide it to me. The reason being, uh, the EIR and subsequent staff report identified initially Captain Randy Pentis as having provided the additional law enforcement information that was included in the EIR. And, uh, and then there was comment about an updated information uh, in Mr. Hawkins' report, uh, wherein I assume he was the one that spoke to Captain Hagel uh, to get fresh numbers. Um, so I know what the number does, now I know what the number includes, and I also know what it doesn't include. Uh, which is a consideration in my in my mind. Um, thank you. Yes, sir. <clears throat> I met last week with Dennis Hawkins, the planner, and got information, but there's nothing really that wasn't in it. I just I just needed some some clarification on this thousand page document. I, I did visit the site on Monday, and. Uh, I hadn't been to Pyro for quite a while. I drove around the area and I was really impressed with the uniqueness of the community. There are some nice residences there. Uh, we have a lot of unique communities in our county, Ojai, of course, Somas, and Pyro, and others too. Uh, this is really a, a unique community. I met with a homeowner that lives in the D area, one of the three homeowners, and with his wife, they were in the front, so I drove in and talked with them. And, they had some concerns. They have horses on their property, and they were afraid that there'd be a problem. They wouldn't be able to have horses. Uh, they were also concerned about uh, education and uh, traffic. They claim when the uh, packing house empties, when they change shifts, the traffic backs up from Highway 26 all the way even past their house. I then went into town and went into this place as shown in this map called they told me to see Jimmy at Jimmy's Ice Cream, and he would give me the full scoop. I went in there. <laughs> Jimmy had a map up. I'm sorry. No pun. Jimmy had a, a, a map on the wall of the project. And I talked with him and talked with a couple other residents, a man who had been born in Piru in 1935, lived there all his life, and went through. And they had uh, concerns. Uh, one of their main concerns was education. And I asked them if they have seen the document and the conversations that went on with the Fillmore Unified School District and the movement of some farm worker children and it wouldn't, shouldn't be a problem. And they certainly were not optimistic about that. And I also asked them if they thought that these new homes and this new population would help the downtown area revitalize a little bit. And their answers were, no, I don't think so, because we don't shop here. We go either toward uh, uh, Valencia, the, to the shopping center before you get to five, or we go to Fillmore. And, but again, that's their impression, so I want to let you know that, that those, those are some of the things that they told me. I also want to confess that I went in for a, ordered a cup of coffee and got in, involved with these people and left and got halfway back to Ventura and realized I hadn't paid him for the coffee. So if he comes after me, you'll understand, but I will get it to him anyway. That's my disclosure. Commissioner Rodriguez. Um, one additional comment. Um, in the course of trying to identify the cost, uh, this background behind the cost, I did have a conversation with the Sheriff's Business Office uh, who provided me a, uh, a uh, part of a cost analysis report related to the contract method, methodology and how the $189,000 figure is uh, ultimately arrived at. If we could, since, since you do have a written document, if we could get copies and have the document itself entered into uh, the record, that would be helpful. Uh, my disclosure is I work with and 
have played music with uh, a lot of people in Piru and the chair of the, the commission is uh, of the Piru Na Neighborhood Council is one of those people. In addition, uh, all the applicants in the room, I have some passing uh, knowledge of relationship as acquaintances. Uh, what's in the report represents, I think, sort of the broad brush overview and uh, there are some specific issues that are raised in the Pirate Neighborhood Council's letter that I think we need to perhaps respond to, but there's nothing substantive uh, in terms of me making a determination. Questions of staff by the commission? Anything specific at this time? Okay, I had asked that, that uh, there be uh, some passing look at SB 18 and consultation. It has been raised uh, and uh, the record needs to reflect a response. I assume SB 18 is the Native American consultation requirement? Indeed. The law was passed a couple of years ago uh, that affects projects filed after a certain date. First, this project was filed well before that date so it's not technically applicable, but we did contact the Native Heritage uh, Commission and received a, a group of about 12 Native American contacts. We sent them a notice of what was being proposed, and uh, we only received one response, and that was a response as to whether or not we'd be hiring uh, Indian monitors for this project. And at that time, we told them that was unknown because we hadn't received information from the... Uh, the uh, uh, Orange County site that, that provides information on that. So it's we're, we're right back to... We have complied with that law, even though the law doesn't affect this particular project. Thank you very much. Okay, one other correction I'd make, I think in response to a comment, it may have been your comment, uh, on the width of the, of the uh, uh, buffer. Uh, was it your comment? Of, I think uh, I said it was between 150 and 300 feet. Uh, it's a 150-foot buffer, uh, but that includes uh, the setback and the cultural practices area, not necessarily the width of the landscape area. And just as a follow-up, my memory is the Ag Commissioner's Office has not, or the Board of Supervisors has not adopted a policy specific. These are still case-by-case -case yes. unique to whatever the area is. Correct. Okay. Are there any other disclosures? Moving to the, <coughs> we'll now open the public hearing. Yes. Well, just an added point, just as information. Had the ordinance on buffers passed, this project as conditioned and designed would have met the requirements. I always love it when we have that discussion. Had the asteroid hit us, I mean, Okay. Well, it was more specific right, as opposed but to <laughs> where, where we are is where we are. But thank you. <laughs> right. Open the public hearing. I have Don Jensen, Jim Finch, Tim Cohen, John Ryder. Um, you are all specific to this, uh, and then I have uh, Michael Faulkner, who's John Ryder's architect. Uh, so, you as applicants, do you want to parse it up, or do you just want me to call you up, or how would you like me to do this? Mr. Ryder. Good evening. Good evening. I'm used to city council meetings. Good, uh, good morning, planning commissioners. My name is John Ryder, uh, and I am the uh, applicant for component A uh, before you for consideration today. Uh, I've been working on this project for over uh, eight years, and I would like to, if I could, invest just a few moments of time to review what has become a long history for my project and hopefully 
help you to better understand my proposal. Uh, and initially in 2001, I processed a general plan amendment screening through the planning department requesting a zone change from agricultural to residential, which would allow for between 10 and 15 resi uh, residential units per acre on the five acre site located at 290 Main Street. Uh, my request for a general plan amendment was approved by the Board of Supervisors in July of 2001. What this approval allowed me to do was move forward in the entitlement process. Over the course of the next year, I worked with my project architect, Michael Faulkner, the community of Piru, and the Neighborhood Council, and then President Stephanie Acosta, in an effort to bring a quality residential neighborhood to the community of Piru. I, uh, I appeared uh, before the Neighborhood Council and conducted workshops with the community, which the community attended, in an effort to meet uh, the residential needs of the citizens of that community. What evolved from those workshops and meetings was a 60-unit residential townhouse pro uh, development. Uh, at that time, my project, to my knowledge, was the only project being proposed for the community of Piru, and so therefore uh, I was considered a standalone project, or at least that's the term I use. However, in late 2002, I was informed by the planning department that another general plan amendment screening for a larger project was forthcoming, and my project, due to the now cumulative impacts, could no longer proceed as a standalone project, would, but would have to be considered as uh, part of a larger project. Uh, and then in July 2004, the county, as staff has pointed out, received a third general uh, plan amendment request. Uh, and then, I'm sorry, that was in July of 2004. After receiving that third request, uh, the Board of Supervisors directed, again as staff has pointed out, that all processing for all aspects of entitlement be done concurrently by the applicants. And the result of that, of course, is what's uh, in before you today, component A, B, and C. Uh, between 2004 and 2006, there were countless meetings conducted uh, in Piru, which included participation on the part of the County of Ventura, uh, the applicants, some of which have changed. I'm still one of the original ones, the original one, and the Piru Area up, uh, Plan Update Committee, and of course the uh, community of Piru. Uh, then from that evolved the charrette process, uh, which was overall, I believe, well received by the community of Piru, and would lay the foundation uh, for the Piru area plan update. In fact, it would become to a great extent the blueprint for development in Piru. Uh, Dennis talked to you, I think, briefly about that uh, process. Uh, once the charrette process was complete and finalized in 2006, it would then require over two more years of processing to bring us to this public hearing today. Um, and I'd like to just pause here to make one point, and that is this, that um, after an eight-year process, it has been all-encompassing, complete, thorough, and totally vetted. It was not rushed. Decisions, uh, they weren't made in haste. Uh, considerable thought and planning, which included, of course, citizen input and involvement, went into what is now the Piru area plan update. Uh, having said that, I'd now like to turn briefly uh, your attention to the merits of my individual project and why I believe my proposal will serve the community of Piru and the County of Ventura well. Uh, as staff has pointed out, my five acres uh, lies within this 62-acre area boundary outlined as exempt from SOAR. Uh, my project is the only project that is totally within the redevelopment agency boundaries of, of Piru. Uh, which was created in May of 1995 by the Board of Supervisors, and I believe that there are some economic benefits potentially to the, uh, the residents of Piru because of that. Uh, again, my project, and I think this is important, clearly fits the definition of an infill development, 
as I am contiguous, as that has been pointed out already, but I will repeat, on two sides by two existing residential developments, Citrus View and Habitat for Humanity, and within 400 feet of an existing apartment project, which I believe makes this a natural uh, spot for uh, development. Uh, my project uh, complies with all the requirements of the Piru Area Plan Update. Uh, the units that are located at the rear of my project that were referred to early, earlier are permissible in the design guideline. Uh, through the use of color and material variations and other architectural elements, I believe these units comport to the cottage cluster concept that was suggested by the design consultant. I would like to emphasize, as staff has pointed out, that these units are located at the rear of the uh, project and not visible from Main Street. Uh, my project will bring aesthetically pleasing, quality and affordable workforce housing to the community of Piru, offering diversity in both product types and style, and offer the uh, opportunity of home ownership. My original proposal in 2002 was for a 60-unit townhouse project. I pointed that out to you, but I have since redesigned my project, reducing it to 49 units and adding a 1.1-acre park that will afford both the homeowners that reside there and the community of Piru much-needed recreational areas. I would also point out that the maintenance and integrity of my project is insured by a homeowners association and homeowners dues. Uh, in closing and speaking for my project, the high development costs and relatively small size of the project, 49 units, makes financial viability of my project, for me at least, a real challenge. Uh, and I am willing and, and happy to pay my fair share of development costs, but I'm unable in any way to significantly redesign my project for a third time. It is cost prohibitive to me at this point. So I would close uh, by respectfully requesting the Planning Commission take action uh, and approve my project and the other components. Uh, if there are any questions specifically of my project, my architect, Michael Fautner, is here uh, to hopefully answer any questions you may have. And I thank you for your time. Uh, actually, let's have Mike Falconer and then we can tag team it. Mr. Falconer? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the Planning Commission, my name is Michael Falconer. I'm the architect for Component A. Um, I won't bother repeating everything that John has pointed out. I think between uh, Dennis and, and John, they've pretty much covered all the bases regarding the project. Uh, we, I will reinforce the fact that we believe that the, um, the project as designed is in substantial compliance with the design, guide, design guidelines as well as the, uh, the Piru area plan. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have regarding site planning, the architecture, the um, cluster village concepts, whatever you may have. I just have a couple of quick ones. Um, there was a question earlier whether the um, trees that were part of the slide tr presentation are those um, still there? The trees are still there today. Okay, they are. Yes. Okay, there mm -hmm. was some question of whether or not they were. And then um, the uh, site plan for the park, is this, uh, are the 49 units going to pay in to maintain that um, park? Yes. Is it for themselves or is it for the larger uh, Piru no. um, population? How is that going to work? Well, it's going to work hopefully the same way with our project as will components B and C. And that the, this is as pointed out by Mr. Hawkins, uh, the parks department for the county doesn't have money to either buy and or maintain these park properties, yet we're being obliged to provide this park land. Therefore, the HOA uh, will be obliged to uh, provide the ongoing operation and maintenance for the park, as well as the site lighting and other things typically uh, provided uh, by virtue of HOA funding. It's not, it's not appropriate to ask about how the economics of that work, right? Certainly within the scope of your 
How does that work out? How does that work out? Just just in turn, just for my curiosity, sure. how does that work out? Forty nine units and, and a park of that size with the with the maintenance. Well, I'll give it give it my best shot. Um, what we're planning on doing is one, obviously, uh, when we do design the park, uh, we'll be using drought tolerant materials, low flow irrigation, and water conservation measures to the extent possible. Uh, two, we're going to provide a photovoltaic on, on some of the buildings such that we can hopefully provide for site lighting uh, with some of help from uh, photovoltaic. Uh, in terms of the overall maintenance and repairs, uh, it's not uncommon in a, um, a large multifamily development to have common space and open areas that require maintenance. So it'll be real similar to that, where you have a landscape service coming in, uh, cutting the grass, pruning the trees, uh, doing repairs for the irrigation system and so on, uh, replacing the lamps for the site lighting, etc. Uh, those are pretty common elements in a um, HOA that has common areas. I think what makes this unique and different is the fact that this space will be open to the public. And I think that's only the real difference between what would otherwise be a common area uh, in a multifamily development and the fact that that common area is going to be open and available to the public and they have the right to access it. So in that regard, there will also be costs for insurance, liability insurance, etc. But those are also costs associated with a typical HOA and again, in a development that has open space and common areas. That's all for me. Mr. Faulkner, so the comments you're making, um, in essence, is saying that, that those issues related to the questions and maintenance are going to be incorporated within CCNRs uh, and uh, process as part of the deeding or entitlement process by individual uh, prospective homeowners. Home That's owner. correct. That's correct. And so anyone buying into that development uh, would know up front what within, because of the CCNRs what oh, the indeed. financial obligations would be You're and the responsibilities for maintenance, etc. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Just to follow up to County Council, um, seems like we are mixing public land use and public policy with private HOA uh, requirements, and I'd be real interested, after you have a second to think about it, how if I'm on the Homeowners Association and I've got sixty to $90,000 worth of damage annualized because of my public park, at some point, can I change my options? since I'm a homeowners association? Uh, no, well, it's part of their RPD permit, which is an ongoing enforceable mechanism to keep the, uh, make sure that the HOA uh, maintains those parks. And if they, um, we've, we've already contemplated this and discussed it in detail, if for some reason the HOA fails to live up to its obligations, um, the county will obviously Im be involved in, as a uh, mechanism, in, as part of the mitigation enforcement program to make sure and as part of their RPD permit to make sure that they do maintain that park. Um, and if for some reason something happens where it's not workable, then we'll bring the Parks Department in because they also have the option of taking over the park at some point from the HOA. Okay, but in, in the, let's play that one out. So they take over the park. Do they also take over the funding? Yes. Okay. If they take over the park, they take over the funding as well. Oh, so, okay, and is that just from a legal perspective, if they take over the funding, determine the funding is not adequate, do they have the ability to, to then ratchet up the funding? Well, I, I, I don't know what the parks, this could happen any time in the future. 100 years from now, I don't know what this uh, financial situation will be in the Parks Department at that time. Um, I, I, don't, I anticipate that if that ever came to be, the Parks Department would understand the level of financial commitment they're getting involved in before they decide to exercise that option. Um, before that, I'm sure that the primary pressure will be on the HOA to maintain their obligations under their RPD permit and make sure that the park does stay in compliance. And hopefully, if some if it starts, the park starts to go south, shall we say, um, that there'll be some involvement with the county and we'll try to work it out. Is there an ironclad mechanism to make this work out? Um, no, probably not. Uh, it's, it's, it's going it's to uh, involve uh, with the county working with the HOA if this does happen. But they do have that obligation, and they understand it, and they need to build that into their HOA fees. And if they have to 
I imagine if they have to issue special assessments or something like that, then they'll have to do that. But the options weren't great because the Parks Department doesn't have the financial ability to take the park. So this, we, we spent a lot of time thinking about this and determined this to be the best option as far as funding this park. Uh, trailing that, um, and my concerns about issues of maintenance obviously are, would be immediate, uh, but even even from a from a point of repair uh, replacement, I can s potentially see issues like that occurring uh, within a 10-year span of construction. Um, does the HOA, would the HOA then have the ability, if it, if it uh, wanted to consider it, uh, the ability to deed the property to the county or the state, county parks and relieve themselves of that responsibility? They have that option, but the county has to accept it. Maybe Bruce has some additional information on that. Uh, right. That's, that's only if the county agrees. Otherwise, it stays with the home, uh, basically the homeowners association as their obligation. In one sense, there's a built-in incentive in that they're not going to allow a physical attribute to their project deteriorate to, to such a point that it would reduce their property values. Um, on the other hand, with the restrictive covenant, they cannot restrict access by the rest of the community to those facilities. So with those and the fact that there has to be full disclosure to anyone purchasing a unit, that they have to understand that portion of their dues will go for eventual replacement as well as maintenance and operations of, of that facility within their project. Capital replacement is typically uh, built into those annual fees. Yeah, I think they, the standard is somewhere in the neighborhood of, well, it's cyclical based on the type of capital expenditure it might be, you know, five to 30 years, depending on the nature of the capital improvement. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Don Jensen. Chairman Bartels, members of the commission, I'm Don Jensen. Yes, sir. I want to thank you and staff as well for all their hard work, but uh, it's nice to be here after the weeks and months of going through the process. It always takes four times longer than we want it to, and I know we're all working to make that better. Um, the project, I think, is something that has had a long evolution. A lot of people really have put input on it. We picked up a site that was uh, kind of, I would say, ill-designed for the spirit of Piru and really have tried to show some things that we hope bring the character of Piru as well as make a marketable product available to the community overall, not just Piru, but everybody that wants to live in Ventura County. Um, wanted to touch on a couple of Commissioner Adukas' comments. Um, basically the site design comments. Um, Dennis touched briefly on how we kind of crafted the site plan. One of the few things that we really thought were important in a small community like Piru was a lot of diversity of product type. Um, actually Mike Faulkner is the architect on about 80-90% 80, 80%, of the product out here. I think we have one of our triplex units that we have built somewhere else that we brought in, but the balance of the site is also designed by Mike. Um, on Main Street, you know, the vision for Main Street is to have kind of a broad, very welcoming lane coming into the community, uh, a street that has heavy canopied trees, big setbacks, and they also talk about large, large homes facing the Main Street. You know, in our mind, it was like a Santa Paula street in downtown Santa Paula. We have the big canopy, the large, older-style farm homes facing the street. Not a completely marketable product in Piru, so we went to a duplex product that provided the massing, had separate entrances on either side, the alley entrance, the big setback. We got good, large, private site yards for those homes. But the idea there is to maintain a kind of an upscale entry to the community that has large structures. Um, the area along 126, we have a requirement to do some detention for drainage to mitigate off-site drainage. We use that as an opportunity to really heavily landscape it. 
you asked a question about is this like the village at the park wall that we all see between Lewis Road and uh, Santa Rosa Road. We happen to be the engineers on that project, so I called the office real quick. That is a 3,000 foot long, 14 foot high, very rigidly shaped straight berm. Uh, we're also the uh, engineers on the Greystone project just over here between Victoria and uh, just behind Phil. That's more the idea of this wall. It's very, it's still heavily landscaped. It's more undulating. Basically, we've got a curvilinear section for most of it. Down in this section, we do have a relatively straight portion of wall, I mean of, of berm, just to make sure we could get the sound attenuation we needed. So we do got a 14 foot high section, but it's further set back, a lot more undulated. It's rounded at the corners, and I think it's gonna be a very nice way to welcome people into the community. Um, the other thing I think uh, Dennis talked about was the bus turnout, turnout leaving on Jim's side of the street right down here. We also have a bus turnout in our project up in this section, which is located in the community park section so we can safely get off the 126 but still uh, deliver the people in that end of town back to their homes. Um, I think we've covered the HOA issue pretty well. This is the park that we're contributing to the overall land area. We've worked closely with Jim Finch um, with the designers on that side as well. Uh, Jim and Tim and I have really been trying to work together, tension being that the requirement was a five acre, very usable park. It's pretty hard for any of us to put five acres in the middle of any of our sites. So. This one plus acre is almost directly across the street from Jim's soccer field area. So these two parts will work very closely together. We intend to have the maintenance be worked out between both of our projects as a master HOA. That master HOA will also cover the common improvements of Main Street that we'll be maintaining the edges of. Um, I think that's pretty much all I, one more, one more thing I wanted to point out. We have this product in the middle. It's a little bit different and it's a very long product. We have no driveways on the street. We have garages on the alley. The other thing that's not so obvious is these units actually work to what we call a side yard. So this guy, as an example, has this area between the units as his, his yard space. Uh, it gives him basically an 80 by 30 or 35 foot deep yard as opposed to a more conventional, um, you know, maybe a 50 by 20 that would be what this guy over here might have. This is a more conventional single family house, a driveway out in front, and a yard width that's the width of the lot. What this does is it effectively gives the width of the side yard quite a bit more length. You only have a yard on one side, but you tend to organize the living space to that side of the house. Uh, you end up with your neighbor's wall being your side yard wall of your home, but it provides a lot more usable outdoor space, which we thought was very important in this community. And I don't think that's something that was completely obvious in the way the architectural plans were presented. So that was my last point. I'm available for any questions. Um, about that uh, 14 foot high uh, section, could you um, just point that out? It actually I'm is. I, right at that point, we're four feet, 14 feet high. This land's coming up, and this actually shelters it because it's a corner of the perk basins back here. Okay, Down say, here. On, say on one of those uh, units along there. Yeah, along there. Uh-huh. What am I looking at? In the backyard. Yeah, what am I looking at? The backyard, you'll have a 20-foot flat area. You'll have, in the backyard, we're quite a bit higher, so the height of the slope is less because we have to build the site up about three, four feet for flood protection. So the backyard will have about a 10 foot high, two to one slope. So their backyards on these, if you see, they're quite deep. So they, you have a 20 to 25 foot backyard and then a 20 foot depth up to a wall that's sitting on top of a slope. And, and is that wall uh, uh, landscaped also? Does it have the vines yes. that attach? Is it slumstone or is it that uh, other product that's... It might, there's... there's the t Yeah, the cement block. Are you using slumstone or are you using cement block? 
Well, slump stone is a cement block. Okay. But the slump stone I'm has. Sorry. The, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There, let me. I mean, there's really three things on the table. It could be a standard masonry block. Probably won't use it. It could be slump stone, or it could be an Allen. I mean, a proto wall, which is not a masonry wall. It's a wall that you actually. Uh, put is steel it, through the middle of it. Is port is it poured in place? No. Okay. Okay. But the, it'll be a articulated block wall. It will be approved by the Piru Neighborhood Council and the Planning Commission. To us, it's the front door. We're going to make it nice. We do have pillars. Um, it's not the kind of wall we think we're going to have pillars every 20 feet on because of all the articulation. I think if you look in the packet in the 11 by 17s in our section. The third one back shows where our proposed pillar locations are right now, and they vary from like 20 feet to there might be a couple sections where we're close to 30 or 40. I guess my concern is how fortress-like is it going to look and feel? I hear some of the neighborhood concerns that we're going to have a new Piru and an old Piru. And is the new Piru going to be fortressed off from the old Piru? Is the new Piru going to have, well, you know, the, their parks and keep out the old Piru? You know, that whole uh -huh. tension. And, and, I mean, what we're trying to keep out with the wall is the noise. We're not doing anything to take this neighborhood out from its connection to the, to the city or the town, I guess. Uh, the park is very open to the community. You know, there's plenty of pedestrian linkage across the community, I mean, our little section of the community. We obviously have to deal with the noise issue, but, you know, there isn't any real public access on this side because of the spreading grounds. Uh, we could work it out with United. We could make a trail work around this end. We've approached them and talked about it, but at this time they're not receptive to it. But if we could do that, there is a part of our conditioning that requires some additional trails that we still need to work through. But there isn't anything on the table to the east this way to, to get to. The new bike, Piru bike trail, of course, is on the other side of town and heads out around the other side of the river. This isn't a very pleasant corridor to try to travel on. Uh, we'd really like to push the energy back up into the older community. The other question I have is about the bus turnout. Is there a bus? Yes. There's right now there's bus service from the community. I don't know if the the public transportation gets Vista Fatco. Vista Fatco. Vista Fatco. Oh perhaps perhaps instead of we can let the county can respond to that. Okay. Okay. Um, because there was a comment on uh, the neighborhood council saying you know the bus the bus turnouts are nice if there was a bus so I wasn't clear whether or not there was a bus there's there Tim and, and Jim are a lot more daily in the community than myself so let them address it okay thank you very much you bet thank you just wait 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 <laughs> Go ahead. Monica not to put you on the spot but you might want to be ready to respond about levels of service relative to transportation. First of all, I want to compliment you, Mr. Jensen, Mr. Wright, and Mr. Finch for your perseverance and your patience in going through this complicated process, and also for your willingness to make the changes regarding the parks and everything. My only question has to do with low and very low housing. Uh, I know that Mr. Ryder has to build 15%. And while the board of or the supervisors have directed you to include this, you've chosen to put 10.5% of your housing. And according to my calculations, you have 91 units at 10.5%. Uh, that would be 9.5 units of low or very low. If you kick that up to 15%, it would be uh, four more units. You would go from 9.5 to 13.65. I'm very interested in that. And uh, 
Is that a possibility from your point of view? The um, I'm going to let Tim address sure. that because he's really been dealing with the community on that and has a lot more background on it. So if I can defer that sure. to Tim. Um, hi, Tim Cohen. Um, <laughs> Steph, I'll give you what I know and then um, in, in lay terms and I'll let planning speak because I don't understand that. Um, the other 4.5% is moderate housing, which would total 15% of the whole matrix of moderate, low, very low, and lower. No. Very low. So, so that, that would, but our project already basically is going to have those moderate homes anyways. The problem is um, if you deed restrict one person's moderate home and do not deed restrict another person's moderate home and they're the same homes, the very last ones that will not sell are those that are deed restricted. So since our project is already going to be almost basically all moderate, um, uh, it, it, the 15% will be there and it actually will exceed it because most of these homes will fall into the moderate category. It just wouldn't be prudent to deed restrict someone's moderate home and not deed restrict another person's because they won't sell. Now, um, that, maybe I'm confused, but that's not my understanding. My understanding in the redevelopment agency that Mr. Ryder has to build 15% of low and very low, not moderate, because but, mostly... Uh, if I may correct, actually it's 15% total of which 40% of that has to be very low, and then of the remaining, there is a policy of the board that half should be low and half should be moderate. So when you really work it out, 10.5% of the units for Mr. Ryder would have to be in the low or in very low categories. The remaining... Um, Four and a half percent are moderate. Well, then I guess I read. I read the report, the staff report, and the EIR. I quoted a couple pages in here, and I'm. That's certainly not my understanding, and uh, it's my understanding the board said low and very low, fifteen percent. What the board. The board originally, when they screened through um, what was um, Mr. Levy's project and Mr. Finch's project, they did not specify at that time a percentage, but they said the project should go forth and have a development agreement that would set aside a yet-to-be-determined percentage of the units for lower income, and that includes low and very low. As Dennis pointed out in 2005, was it? 2005, the Board of Supervisors said, because we were asking the question, well, what percentage? And Supervisor Long made the motion, the Board passed it, which was to give us direction to at least initially proceed on the, the understanding that those projects outside of the redevelopment agency area would be held to the same standard but then she put in several caveats and said, well, that, that's a starting point. We will determine um, when it comes back to us what actually should be enacted or adopted. These project applicants uh, have said to us that they cannot do their projects based on the same percentages as if, as if they were within the redevelopment area. Since their project is, all, um, is moderate income anyway, and we are showing in our housing element sufficient amount of moderate, we don't see the need to, as was pointed out, to restrict some units for moderate income and then have unrestricted units for the same income category. Well, so that's with regard to the moderate. With, the, with regard to the low and very low, the applicant said, well, we can provide low income and still make our projects work. We cannot provide the percentage that was suggested with regard to very low. And since our housing element does not differentiate uh, in terms of the overall quantity of housing for 
lower income category. Um, we felt that um, that was at least meeting the intent or the overall it is providing a public benefit in terms of meeting the county's overall housing needs, although it we readily met it doesn't exactly follow what the board's direction was back in 2005. That's my point, and also, I don't, f from what you're saying, there's no difference between Mr. Ryder's project and these, even though he's in the redevelopment agency, and he has to provide 15 percent, which is which would be 7.35 units. He doesn't have to provide 7.35 units or low or very low. He can take 10 point 10 percent of that and then say the rest is moderate. Is that correct? What's the difference between Mr. Ryder's requirement and what Mr. Jensen and Mr. Finch are proposing? What's the difference between them? There's, can I answer that real quick? One of the obvious differences is the density. We're looking at about 5.7. I'm sorry, I missed that. One of the major differences. One of the major differences in our project is the density. One of the things we've been trying to respond to since we took the project over was to get the density and the you know, our product is not single family exclusively. We have the duplexes and the triplexes, mm -hmm. which narrow down the footprint, but we're still only at about 5.7 units per the acre. I believe uh, Mr. Ryder's project is still very close to 10 units to the acre. And it's a little easier to get the economics on a 10 unit per acre project to provide the low and very low uh, product type. The second factor may not be in listening to the community, they're very much opposed to additional very low income housing in that community because they have too much of it already. And they were, you know, we were trying to get their support as part of the Pyro Neighborhood Council towards our project. So we were actually working with them when we, we originally proposed having a 20% moderate requirement in the product or in the project. And we've actually come down to this 10.5%, which I think set at low income levels. And we've always anticipated being able to deliver a product a little bit more affordable out there, and that's why we do have the denser products in the triplex and the duplex units in there, so we can keep the cost down and, and deliver it without a lot of um, difference to the marketplace, if you will. I thank you for that clarification about the density of the units, but I'm still haven't gotten an answer to my question as to what's the difference between what Mr. Ryder must do and you are and you are volunteering to do. Uh, what mu well, Mr. The, Ryder's in the redevelopment area, so he has to do the the state law requires him to do it in the redevelopment area. Right. Within our area, we can actually negotiate it because it's kind of an optional agreement, if you will. It, it still has to be approved by the board, but it, it's what we've proposed and staff has agreed to agree with us at this point. But it is a little different than if we were in a straight redevelopment zone, state mandated 15% affordable. And the 15% affordable is set out in the state code to be at three different levels. It's very low, low, and moderate. So there's never been a 15% low and very low requirement on any of these projects anywhere in the county. And I know that because I do a lot of projects in the city as well, and we often run into this, but um, that's pretty fair, isn't it, Bruce? Then I guess my last question would be to Mr. Ryder. Is his 15% going to be all low and very low, or are some going to be moderate? Could I ask Mr. Mr. Go? May I ask Mr. Ryder that question? Also, I'd refer you to page 16 in the staff report. 16? Yes, it has a... Uh, yeah, 14 and 16 are the, some of the things I've been looking at. Yeah. It will show you that the writer project of the 15%, 4.5% of that is for moderate. So in the end, as far as low and, and very low, the 10.5% component is across the board with all three projects. So there is a consistency there, is what yes. you're saying? Okay. That's fine. That answers my question. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Bruce, for the clarification, too. I've asked. Uh, go ahead, Commissioner Rodriguez. Um, come back. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir.
Uh, as it relates to the, the construction of the park and Greenbelt area, those costs, and are going to be uh, trailing this, the reader property issue, those costs are going to be incorporated into the CCNRs uh, uh, and be part of the HOA's uh, yes, responsibilities. The, the, the developer will design and construct the parks completely. The budget for the parks maintenance and long-term replacement, as Bruce described, will be actually set up with a DRE approved budget when the HOAs are formed. As the HOAs get managed over time, they'll have slight variations in their budget. The budget is distributed out amongst the homeowners in a monthly dues association assessment, and they will pay the cost of the parks and the upgrades that the community receives throughout the life of the project. Yeah, I'm familiar with HOAs and CCNRs. Uh, the, uh, uh, does that mean it's include the perimeter wall and, uh, and uh, the landscaping that goes with it? Um, at least on the outside. I'm not that's, saying that's, we go in the people's backyard. No, that's not what I'm referring to. I'm referring to the, to the, the uh, perimeter wall on top of that burrow that you're yes. talking about, for example. We put that, the HOA boundary right down the center of the wall. In, okay, so. and that wall continues around the eastern perimeter of, that, uh, of this parcel? It goes up recall. about, as a uh, sound wall, about to where the curve in the road ends. So the burrow will be capped with a six-foot wall? Yes. Uh, but that six-foot wall will not continue northbound along the uh, United Water property. The six-foot wall will, but it probably once we get past the landscaped area on the east, we will probably end up putting that in the backyards as a privately owned wall to maintain. Okay. What is uh, what is uh, Mr. Reader's uh, component A uh, evident and related to to that the component A property uh, testimony this morning was that. There has to be a uh, change in grade elevation from the existing, I think, raised an additional three and a half feet, if I'm correct. Um, what is the situation with grade on this particular parcel, particularly as it relates to uh, the eastern boundary uh, that butts up against the United Pot Water, since there is no berm going to be in place there? There is a, actually a downslope right now from the United Water property that is the, the dike separating the basins from our property. Downslopes toward your it property? It slopes towards our property. Our property is lower. Okay. The United, and it comes up, comes down and into the pond, so it's really a dike. Okay. And what we expect to have the ability to do, and we have talked with, you know, preliminarily with United to fill that gap in so that we're basically filled straight across to their elevation and then the wall would be basically at grade. Okay. Um, is the intent then of the, uh, as it relates to housing here, the intent is to, to build all all the uh, the housing dwelling units at, at the moderate level, moderate income level? Moderate or low. Or low. Uh -huh. is, is there any intent to mitigate that, that offer or obligation uh, and pay a mitigation fee in lieu of construction? I think the options provided in the conditions. Correct. We, we haven't come to the final decision on that, but at this point I'd say no. I mean, we don't know the exact cost of the units and where the market will be, you know, two years from now. Uh, the expectation is no, we, we build the units and sell the units per the 10.5% at low levels that we put in there. Would those units be identified in a cluster fashion within that parcel or would they, uh, with that component or would they be sp spread they out be throughout the parcel? They throughout the, the development. Okay. And the, the design that we had from the beginning was expectation of spreading it throughout because that's the popular and right way to do it. So this is set up to provide that. And it'd be primarily in the triplex or duplex units, but you can see they're pretty uniformly spread throughout the site plan. And lastly, uh, uh, the staff report comments about this issue of, uh, of mitigating cost uh, that this project will impact. Um, what is your position on the issue of uh, Community Facilities District, uh, Mello Roos, uh, um, funding for this, for this mitigation issue? What's your position on that? I would be in agreement with Mr. Finch's uh, comments reported by Dennis that it, it really feels like an extra burden to 
put you know somebody new to the community, uh, saddle them with an additional charge where the other 99.5% of the residents in the county, well, maybe it's less than that when you think of county residents, but to burden them with extra law enforcement costs that isn't equally shared seems a little uneasy or a little unequal. But which translates, as the report indicates, translates to approximately $20 per month per household. Annualized to 230 I think, is what was identified. And, I mean, that is going to be on top of them providing the parks and paying for the parks. And, um, you know, the cost of ownership in the community is already, you know, it's not a high-end community to begin with. So we're, we're going to be struggling to meet the market out there on the entry level kind of homes we're not looking at this as you know being comparable to something in agora or calabasas or oak park um, so it's very difficult to take any additional costs into these homes okay thank you i've asked the county uh floodplain administrator to speak and I, we've got a window, so I'm hearing people talk about raising the the uh, um, lots or raising the, the site. What's the requirement for a uh, hundred year specific to Pyru and specific to these sites? Okay, uh, my name's Ray Gutierrez. I'm a manager of development and inspection services in the Public Works Agency. I do serve as floodplain manager for the County of Ventura. Um, I was asked to just come down and, and start answering questions. Now, I don't have the, the firm map in front of me. I have one up in the office. I, I likely should get that, and I could address each parcel by, uh, uh, specifically. But in general, I have looked at it a while back. And the Piru Creek in the what's known as the revised preliminary flood insurance rate maps that were produced by FEMA uh, on May 30th of 2008, it did show that uh, the Piru floodplain is expanded into the Ryder property. I do know it went significantly into the Ryder property. It also appeared, as I recall, uh, continuing to the to the south to um, um, to the 126. Now, I did talk with Mr. Uh, Ryder on the phone about this, and I was examining his topography on his uh, site plan, and. The uh, flood insurance rate maps are done on what's called the uh, 1988 uh, uh, NAVD datum, which is basically a survey datum. And I was noticing that his survey was done, uh, I believe, based on a 1929 datum. And I felt that his elevations were high enough that possibly the FEMA floodplain could be redrawn and be almost entirely removed from the Ryder property because the topography that was currently surveyed by M3 Civil, his consultant, uh, was high enough than what the water elevations were being projected uh, on the FEMA uh, flood insurance rate maps proposed. So I, I, I told uh, Mr. Ryder to that he, as a property owner, could submit what's known as a LOMA, uh, a letter of map amendment with the um, M3 civil topography and provide that to FEMA right now and they would be able to update their maps to possibly take the Ryder property out of the floodplain entirely, the proposed that, that, the, that FEMA has, has, uh, is saying. Now, I haven't looked at the other properties as far as their topography, but the county, the county of Ventura currently is... Um, involved in what's known as the Santa Clara River Study. I know the city of Fillmore is involved in it, and city of Santa Paula and, and Oxnard. And we have, uh, we are uh, attempting, we the county are attempting to re-examine uh, that floodplain in in the Piru Creek, and we're, we're questioning those flows, those cues. We're questioning uh, the assumptions that FEMA made. So it's somewhat in an appeal period. And we believe that um, our data will likely um, uh, eliminate that floodplain 
as, as it has expanded on the Piru side down where the affordable housing projects are proposed. So we think, we think that that floodplain may be removed as part of the appeal or each property owner could provide better topography data to show higher ground, let's say, so that the floodplain ends up being shifted over more towards the Piru Creek. So that's, that's a process. I can't give you an absolute answer yet, but that's, that's the process we're, you know, we're, we're attempting to, to work through. Okay, but are, are we robbing Peter to pay Paul in shifting that? No, no, that's just looking at better data, better okay. topography, because FEMA doesn't have uh, that type of topography. And then let's just say if the floodplain ends up staying on the property, what kind of things happen? The applicants would be required to elevate their houses in such a manner that water can flow through the development and, and flow under the houses. Not that they'll be raised on, on stilts, but that the houses would have vents built underneath them in the foundation areas. There'll be an elevated finished floor one foot above the 100-year water surface elevation and then they'll have waterproof materials around the base of the house with these vents that allow the water to flow through it. I mean, that's a common practice in the unincorporated county when people build in a floodplain to elevate, have these vents. Uh, there's an elevation certificate filed and they pay flood insurance for that. So that's basically the process. And it is allowed in, in the unincorporated areas in Ventura. Can't do it in the floodway, but you can do it in the floodplain. And we're only talking about floodplain here. Floodplain here, this isn't the floodway at all in any of these properties. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Okay. Jim Finch. Thank you. My name is Jim Finch. I'd like to thank staff for the novel that they have produced. I've learned a lot in this process. Thank you for letting me speak today. I've been going through this process for over five years. This is not my business. I farm. This farming is my day job. We farmed in Piru since 1955 after my father moved there in 37. And we will continue to farm after this, after this is concluded. We still will be farming the parcel next door, as you've heard. Piru has seen an evolution over the last century, and it will continue to see an evolution. Citrus is almost all but gone around Piru. Nurseries and vegetable crops and, and new things are coming. Shade houses are coming to Piru. All of these, fortunately or unfortunately, but they take more, more labor, require more labor. In the nursery business, one person per acre is about the norm, and in some cases, even a little bit more. In, in oranges, it was one person per 50 to 60 acres. Lemons were slightly less, maybe one person per 45 acres. So agriculture is evolving and Piru has con will need needs to continue to evolve. I think this plan is a great evolution. I showed up the first time with a plan that doesn't look anything like this. They wanted to throw me out and I don't blame them after going through this learning process. We've incorporated a park. We've incorporated a cottage unit, which is a true cottage unit. It's an individual unit. We went down to Pasadena and you could find the courtyard or cottage housing down there. It is an old form that is being revitalized. Your concern on 35 feet on the mixed use commercial thing. I have no trouble setting that absolute. It is not intended to be a monstrosity. It is intended to keep with the character of the old brick buildings that can be seen in Fillmore, Santa Paula, Piru. Some of them were two-story and are two-story in downtown Santa Paula. The colorations don't show up well oh, there. There was an ugly green, I'll admit. Um, but that, that character is what we're trying to attempt to bring in. The bottom is not divided up. It is not a vertical division. It's one 8,000 square foot lot. Piru, you know, a nice little market space or somebody who's, it can always be divided, but it won't be built in that way. If somebody needs 8,000 square feet of modern space, 
it's there for the use of it. And maybe a business can come in. Maybe it's a who knows what. Do they shop there now? No, because there's only about two stores that they are left to shop with post-earthquake. I keep looking up thinking there's something. My project's up there. I apologize. Uh, the variety of housing types. There is a 9,000 foot lot. I think there's seven or eight of them. It, there's some alley loaded product trying to pull, pull back the garage from the front scape and get back to the old. Is it absolute? No, there are some garages that face on, forward. But I think there is that variety that evolves from an old, a town being built over time. One of the initial concerns I heard was the impact of how impactful this 300 and some odd, odd houses will be on Piru. I, that was in 2002 when I started to hear that. Given where we're at today, will anything be done in the next five years? I'd almost bet money or I bet money that it won't. So, and then it will phase in over, you know, five, six, who knows how long it'll take to phase in. So you're talking about a 15 plus year time frame over which from the start of this and the concern, and if you average it in, I don't think you will see any large spikes in, you know, the doubling of the size of Piru or 50% increase in the size of Piru. I think many of these will be affordable and low without any deed restrictions. And Tim spoke to that beautifully, and I won't go back into that. The ag buffer. I, I will be the one farming on the other side, and as Bruce rightfully indicated, we'll throw a deed restriction on that. Um, currently, there is no ag buffer between where I farm up to the edge of Main Street and Mal's house that sits directly across, or the Habitat for Humanity. And I farm in several other places, both in Satakoy and in Ventura, Ventura Avenue, where I go right up to people's backyards or next to the street. The big, most important thing on the ag buffer is not distance. It's vegetation and vertical height when it comes to pesticides or dirt and noise. Trees block noise better than anything. And I think the, the uh, Ag Commissioner's recommendation that I guess isn't formally adopted has, you know, it, it varies, you know, th 300 or something feet barren or lessens as vegetation is planted. Our intent is with a vegetative berry because I honestly don't think that the 300 feet wide open is as impactful as a smaller distance with trees. You can hearken back to the days of the windrows in Oxnard lining Ditch Road or, or Rose. They're very, they're very efficient at knocking down wind. And I think the biggest complaint from a row crop standpoint is dust. And Mal will definitely back me up on that. Um, I've invested a great deal of time and a great deal of money Don's number of four times what expected, what I was told, is, is accurate. Um, oh, water. One, one question was about water. Citrus in Piru uses probably two and a half acre feet when it's sprinkle irrigated in the inland areas. When it was furrow irrigated, it was probably three and a half acre feet. Row crops are in the four to five acre feet, depending on the rotations and the crops used. Even with drip, it's still in the low fours, and in the sprinkle, it's in the high fours. So figuring a half acre, which is kind of the rule of thumb that I've heard per household per year, at 5.4, you're at slightly more than two and a half acre feet of water usage per acre, whereas citrus, or whereas the citrus was using about the same amount of that and vegetables are using about four to five acre feet, so it'll actually be a decrease in water usage. And with that, thank you. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Tim Cohen. Uh, I 
I'd like to thank Jim. I don't think anybody's ever said I said something beautifully. <laughs> but I would sincerely like to thank the planning staff. Um, I know everybody comes up here and says that, but after seeing what they've been through and what we've been through with them, um, I don't know how I don't have hair and, and they don't as well. <laughs> but I would like to thank um, everybody for this process uh, since 2002. It's over six years in the making. Uh, quite a long time and, and certainly expensive and that at the end ends up going back to the consumer. Um, I have a unique perspective on this project as I've served on um, different sides of the proposed developments while serving on the Piru Area Plan Development Committee. Uh, the first proposal brought to the committee by another developer was unacceptable to almost everyone in the community with a proposed density of over 10 units an acre. I am now proud to be associated with our plan that is under five and a half units per acre. As you know, the SOAR ordinance adopted by the voters of Ventura County exempted the lands that we're talking about. And I quote the reason why, to address the special needs of the community. And I can only assume the voters recognize that Piru needs change. I provided with you an exhibit showing the individuals living below the poverty line within Ventura County. You will note that in Piru, it is 27.2% of our residents live below the poverty line. The U.S. average is 12.4. Piru almost has twice as many as other, any other area in Ventura County, and that being Oxnard at 15.1. You ask why our proposal is the way it is in regard to low-income housing. It's because we have enough. There's a proposal by Carrillo Economic Development to add another 66 units of the lowest housing in Piru. So when you look at the community as a whole, which is what we do, we try to look for an economic and equitable balance. And by forcing our projects to exasperate what Cabrillo's coming with, which should be a very good project and will be welcome to the community, it doesn't make sense for Piru as a whole. And that's what we look at in the area plan. Piru hasn't fielded a Little League team in three years. The Boys and Girls Club left Piru in March of this year because they stated that we didn't have enough children there for them. That has to change. Our downtown business district has over 50% of its stores not only closed, but boarded up. Mr. We need Tom, new can residents. Can you go back for just one second? Yes. What did the Boys and Girls Club say? They said, uh, first, they didn't know there was a Piru Neighborhood Council to tell us that they left, but they abruptly left in March and moved over to Rancho Sespe, and there they went. Okay. Thanks. Yes. Our Piru Neighborhood Council has uh, been deficient in the last three years. Uh, there's typically five people that serve on that board. Uh, there has not been over three in the last two years. As I stated, our downtown business district is boarded up. We need new residents. We need new people. We need new opportunities in Piru. Although these comments paint a rather bleak picture, uh, Piru certainly has its strengths. Uh, families have lived there for generations. Piruvians are very proud and resilient. And I have found personally very welcoming. In regard to the staff report, I do take issue with the request to form a CFD for law enforcement. Uh, Piru does not have a city police force. The monies that collected by this proposed CFD have no mechanism of staying in Piru. It would be unfair to burden these new homeowners who will already be saddled with an HOA for the new community parks to pay these monies. Um, if you come to Piru, um, not to belittle $20, but $20 a month is a lot. Um, it's a lot for a lot of people, and as a percentage to what these houses will sell for, it is significant. You did receive a letter from uh, Janet Bergamo, uh, the president of the, uh, president of the, or actually the past president of the Neighborhood Council. Um, in September, the Pirate Neighborhood Council authorized a letter to modify the 2006 letter that you received 
from the Paraguay Hibbert Council stating unwavering opposition to the projects. Um, on page two, paragraph four, line three, uh, Janet describes that Pyro Neighbor Council has already stated a willingness to reverse the unwavering opposition stance. Um, that letter should have uh, been a little cleaner um, based upon uh, the minutes and the people that attended that meeting. I would have to say that um, I'm a little disappointed that uh, this letter, which has been three or four months in the making, comes last night. Um, and certainly it is a little unclear uh, on page one, paragraph two, where it says, I have been asked by the PNC board president, Janet Bergamo, to speak on behalf of the pirate community. It's not clear to me who the author is of the letter. Um, and certainly uh, the other comment I would have on the letter is it, it really should be, um, I would say, from Janet Bergamo individually. Um, the comments that made in here were never ever authorized by the Neighborhood Council in any public meeting or discussed in, in the context that it was presented. I do appreciate your time and certainly your service. And um, if there's any other questions, I'd be welcome to answer for you. Question? Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, I do. Just a moment. Mr. Sure. Uh, thank you. The perimeter of your property, I'm specifically talking about the north end as I read the, the, uh, the drawings. Mr. Armstrong's not here, is he? I don't s Your architect's not here. Um, yeah, I was going to say, I don't oh, know I Mr. See, Armstrong. Okay. He doesn't build me yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> okay. Um, but as I, look at, as I look at the drawings, there isn't any issue of alleyways uh, around the perimeter of the property on the... On no, the, I, I, I salt, believe salt we talked to the... Or landscape. I believe the, police, uh, the sheriff was talked to about um, alleyways and such, and they didn't feel that was a defensible area, and mm -hmm. they didn't want any alleyways okay. on the backside. Okay. Um, and just to clarify, I think uh, your comments, uh, you would not support uh, boards, the board's... Uh, um, authorization of Melarus funding to, to address this mitigated issue of law enforcement. That's correct, sir. Okay. Um, you also recognize that that the development, I guess this is addressed to all three um, applicants here, the development of this property, bringing in and, and, and establishing these residences creates a workload um, situation that impacts the greater community that exists at the present time to the tune of about 60% population uh, growth at, at build out. I, I agree, and, and it will provide for, um, based on the sheriff's um, estimation, a half of a sheriff. Um, to say that we have 1,700 residents and that we have 1.5 sheriffs today um, would be uh, interesting. Um, the sheriff does a great job out there. We have a new um, captain in Fillmore, Tim Hagel, who is. You know, if, if you tell me that I could have four more of him, I would pay for him. I'm sorry. Uh, they do a great job right now. But if if we're going to keep these monies in Piru and you're going to prove that the sheriff's going to be there the whole time um, and people are going to get the direct benefit of their monies, so be it. But they're already paying for half a sheriff, and that's what their taxes are for. And, and I, I don't think it's fair to tax people additionally when they're already being taxed in the first place. And yes, it is an increased burden, but it also is providing increased tax incremental revenue. Probably more than what's in Pyro today. I don't know the exact tax world, but uh, the homes that are in Pyro have been in families for generations and probably are assessed at twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars some of these homes. So we're bringing in new homes with new assessments at new dollars and, and that's providing a new half of a sheriff. The, the comment that you make uh, as relates to the taxes that would be brought in to theoretically then pay for an additional funding of a half position, in fact, um, in fact, uh, creates a situation that you're trying to avoid um, because it then those property taxes are a general fund issue and not restricted to the locale where they're generated or the, uh, in this case, the community facilities district or act. Um, where they have to, in fact, be used for the purpose 
and for the for the uh, purpose and location where they were generated. Um, I don't know if you realize that or not. You're saying that you're, you're saying that the, that the, CF, that the additional charges for the police protection would stay in Piru. That's the whole purpose of Melo Roos, to pay the, for those to pay for those. Okay, but it's going to a general to, fund for the to, unincorporated part of Ventura County, and how do we really know? That, that's why I'm saying the difference between having a city. Uh, there's a city police force in, in Fillmore. Well, you know how many sheriffs are there because they they handle that, but they also contract out to uh, Piru. And I guess my, my point is um, I, I can understand paying an assessment for a park because it's right next to me and I get to use it. Um, intangibly paying taxes twice for a sheriff that I'm not certain is there in the first place or might be there multiple times more than what I'm paying my fair share of. Well, Hard to quantify. Let me one thing. I'm not sure if, uh, if, if you understand this aspect. I probably don't. Of the calculation <laughs> of the uh, Mellow Roos. Um, they took the, the cost of a full sheriff and deducted half of it, the, the revenue that would be coming from the taxes. The Mellow Roos is only paying for half a sheriff. The so other half of a... The, the taxes generated by the homes, if, if all things happen, would provide a tax income to pay for half of a sheriff. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So then we're talking about the second half. Right. The right. second half. I, 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 maybe I misunderstood you, but I, uh, what I understood you to be saying is that not only would you be paying half through the taxes, but <laughs> that Mello Roos was going to pay for a whole no entire police officer. That's how I understand it to be. No, no, mm -hmm. that no. that was calculated. It was calculated. You, it was roughly one hundred ninety thousand. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure on the numbers. Took half of that off, coming from the tax revenue, left roughly a hundred thousand. It's allocated proportionately to your development, with considering that you are going to be paying, or we will re be receiving uh, fifty percent of the revenue from taxes, both sales and property taxes. So there isn't any double. Uh, okay. Recovery under the Mellow Roos and the taxes. Just to clarify. In short, I'm still against it. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's all I have right now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Eric Helgemans. Oh. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Eric Helgemo, and I'm a citizen in Piru. Um, I've lived there for seven years. I've been an active participant in the community for 10 years as a, one of the local business owners, agricultural business. And um, <clears throat> I see this development. I sat on the, the community development committee that advised for with uh, Dennis Hawking and, and Bruce on how to come up with a better plan for Piru. I think uh, Piru is a, is, a, is a very old and established uh, community. Uh, I have kids in the community. There's not uh, enough resources as far as volunteers to pool together to get anything going. Um, and I think that the, uh, the development will help bring more people to the community, but also provide the, the parks that are kind of missing from the community that's existing there. And I, I see it as a, a total positive to the community. The one opposition that everybody had with the development was putting more low income housing into the development. And that I would say is the number one reason why those who are left are still opposing this development. But I was there in the beginning when we started off with the 10 unit thing and everybody was opposed to that because everybody thinks more units more low income. We got enough low income in Piru now. I live in the community and I would agree with that. There is a lot of low income uh, there now. And the, pro the only difficulty with that is they don't, the low income uh, portion of the community does not get the, the side benefit of the portion of the community with income if they're not there. In other words, like those businesses that are in town would do better. I, I disagree with whoever it was that, that said that the businesses wouldn't do better in town because if you have more people in town, I live in, in Piru, so I know if you need a loaf of bread and it's there in town, you're going to go get it there in town, even if you pay a little bit more for it. You're not going to drive all the way to Fillmore or Santa Clarita for your services. But 
if there's not enough people exercising use of those benef those uh, businesses that are there, then the businesses fail. And it's happened over time and time and time again. And you're hearing the same story, but I'm here to affirm that as somebody in the community watching it happen. Our local coffee shop just closed again for the third time Tuesday. And I go there not because I need coffee. I just want to support the community in some way, shape, or form. But if we don't, we need, Piru needs this type of development. And I think we've done a good job of, of making it look nicer as it improves the, the entry to the town. We went through all the different scenarios, and I think I, I want to thank the, the, uh, the planners that came out to help us come up with those plans. But, um, you know, we live in that community, so they gave us an opportunity to comment on what we like to see, and I see most of those elements here. I don't see, you know, I mean, there, it's never going to be perfect. It's not going to be 100% the way that everybody in the town wants to be, and it's not going to have every element that everybody wants to have in it. But I'm surprised how much that they actually did fit into to the, uh, to the plan. And I, I think I speak for some of the citizens in the community that want to see this plan move forward is they, they need, there needs to be some change there. I mean, you, the, the new sheriff or the new uh, uh, captain that's handling Piru is doing an outstanding job. 100% has nothing to do with this meeting, but even he will tell you that the kids in the town don't have anything to do, anywhere to go. So what they do is they go down and they get a can of spray paint from somebody's garage and they start painting on walls and things like that. You can, I, I see that the Pyre Elementary School uh, uh, principal is here and he'll tell you where everybody in town goes to play soccer. In the, pirate, in, in the school where there's no soccer field, every single day you can see people there after hours d doing that. The soccer fields provided in this uh, development will give those people a, a place to go and use it. They don't drive there. They walk. And they'll walk there too because it's part of the community. They've left access open to all of those facilities. And if you give them something to do, then they won't be doing other, other things. I have some experience. I'm a former L.A. County uh, deputy sheriff left on good terms to go into my own business. But I've seen the same thing happen in other communities where I've lived and participated in other unincorporated county areas of the communities. You've got to give these kids something to do. I'm really sad to hear about the, the Boys and Girls Club leaving because those types of things or choosing to be elsewhere because there's not enough kids or not enough volunteers or not enough of anything. It's just not a, a big enough community to... Get the volunteers that are needed. You know, I, I was trying to find out where the, they've been bugging me for years to get on the, the disaster response team in Pyru, the CERT team that they've been trying to get together for years and years. And I just called around trying to find out what happened to it. It's gone. It's gone. There's not enough people to serve on those, in those committees. And maybe it's because part of the community that's, that we have, too big of a portion of the community is, is unemployed, is looking for work, is having troubles where they don't, they can't, or aren't able to, to, to participate in those things. And it's my hope, you know, as hopefully one of the more positive uh, people in the community, that some of these changes can happen and occur in this town if we proceed forward with this. I have, I, I sure hope that Mr. Finch is wrong. <laughs> I don't want to wait five years to see these developments go in. I want to see these developments go in next year. We need the people now. We need the help. We need the services. This, and um, I just wanted to 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 come here and and share that with you. And I'm I'm urging you to uh, give a, a positive vote or passing or however whatever it is that it's done to to facilitate this development. And I thank you very much. You have kids. I have kids. How old? Seventeen, seven, seven, and uh, four. What's your experience with the gang problems that uh, are occurring in Piru? Uh, I try to keep my kids away from the gang problems that occur in, in Piru, and I I've seen a lot of it is just too much time on their hands, and there is not really much to do in in Piru. Um, we've got to give them something to do. If we don't have something for them to do, and the parents are, you know. 
unable to do it because they both have to work because of uh, financial circumstances. You've got to have some place for them to go and something for them to do. And right now there's too many bushes and things like that where the wrong kinds of things happen. So um, so is it your experience that there is a, a that there are gangs trying to... Um, what's I've, your, I've what's not, your experience and what's your knowledge about, you know, on the I've not there? seen uh, problems with violent gang activity. Is it tagging crews? Tagging crews are definitely a problem. You can, it, you don't have to look very far to see that. And um, it seems like uh, the, the Sheriff's Department participation in trying to resolve some of these things are going up. I know there's a task force working on that now. We've never had that kind of cooperation before. We've got a, done a lot of complaining and not a lot of, of things happening, but... You know, that's my experience. It's more drug use uh, going on in the community that's there. Um, I don't know what else I can tell you about it. It's it's got its it's got its element. And I, but you know, the when you when these when this new part of the branch of the community uh, comes into play, it, I don't believe that it's going to add more uh, of those types of problems. It's going to bring a balance to the community. It's going to bring uh, people who uh, can afford to move in, into these uh, communities. Hopefully, we'll have a, a better ratio of disposable income, which can help out in the community. And there'll probably be uh, families with children that'll be a part of this community. And no, I don't. I don't see any separation. I live in the biggest house in Piru. And my kids play with kids from Piru. And there's not a big division as far as, as that that you see. So. Thank you very much for your perspective. Thank you. Mike Namas. Thank you, Tim. Good morning. My name is Michael Namas. I'm a resident of Piru. I was on the area plan update committee and I will be a, a member of the neighborhood council next year. I hate to rehash uh, what's been said before, but I want to make a few points. The issue of low income in these projects was when the when we became aware that Cabrillo Development was going to put in a project, a 66 home project, we felt that we needed a balance and not require so much of the low income in the other projects in Jensen and Finch. This community, uh, in 2000, the 2000 census, the average household income in Piru was $40,000, approximately 50% below the average for the county. It is the poorest area in the county. It has the highest uh, rate of deteriorated homes. It's basically a very poor place. And we need to upgrade that, and we need new people, new blood, new energy in the area to be able to revitalize the town. Otherwise, it's going to die. We have trouble getting people to come to the area council, uh, Piru council meetings. People are apathetic, tired, overworked. Many of them don't, just don't have the time. The idea, I have to go back to a couple of issues. Um, the low income issue, I think that in general, we really didn't want that. In fact, I've got 58 signatures. This, this is a petition that was put out in town, not to no and went door to door. It was put out in town in the restaurants and grocery stores and asked people if they believed in supporting the projects along Main Street, specifically uh, Finch and Jensen Cohen. And they were categorically in favor of no low income components. They said we're poor enough. 58 people doesn't sound like a lot of people, folks, but there's only 900 adults in town. That's 6%. Try to get 6% of the people of Ventura to sign a petition. So there is some 
strong feelings in the community about wanting development. The other issue I'd like to address is the issue of the Melarus and specifically the sheriffs. We are underserved as it is. The average in the county, they say they, you have one sheriff for every 1,200 people. We've got 1,800 people approximately. We don't get 60 hours a week of a sheriff. We get a drive-by once or twice a day, once per shift basically, three times a day. A drive-by. They drive through town. And then they come out when there is an incident. Police enforcement is reactive, not proactive in general. So we are definitely underserved. We, at the present time, we don't get the services that we paid for. The taxes, the propositions that we all, they all get money for, we are underserved. The police officer that handles from Santa Paula to the county line is doing backup in Fillmore. That's why he's not out at our place. There's those issues, I mean, we really are angry. We used to have a substation, and we had a police officer that was there 40 hours a week. We felt like we got something from the county government. We don't feel like we're getting anything from the county government at, at this time. It's really, uh, the, the people are really dissatisfied with what services they've gotten from the county. Now, Monica Nolan is trying very hard Got a lot of little projects going in town, helped us a lot, a lot, and I hope bringing the people's feelings back up and get pride in their community. But I do appreciate the time to talk to you and could submit, the, submit this to you. Thank you very much for your time. I need a clarification. Are these people opposed to any? No, of the these people are in favor of the development. May I finish my sentence? Yes. Are these people that signed this petition opposed to the affordable units that are part of this project? From the people I've talked to, yes, they are opposed to the Any low income. income. The, uh, all four they, of what, them. what they would like to see is what the whole community wanted was uh, in the start. The, when we started the area plan, the attitude of the council and those people that were on the area plan update committee, the local residents, they wanted 6,000 square foot lots. They didn't want high density. They wanted things to be similar to the existing community. This is the compromise that we've ultimately come up with, and we are happy to live with it at this point. You're welcome. Barbara McCray Ortiz. Sorry, I always put the emphasis on the wrong okay. level. <laughs> Good morning, um, Chairman Bartels and um, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Barbara Matthew Ortiz. I'm an affordable housing specialist uh, in private practice in Oxnard. And I um, wanted to speak to you today about just a couple of things, one with respect to affordable housing, the other with respect to Mellow Roos, both um, uh, related to my experience. I think there were a couple of um, misstatements in the, um, in the staff report there with respect to affordable, uh, affordability issues that I just wanted to bring to your attention. Uh, on the, um, the 1,523, they said I think that was... Uh, 45% of the community could afford that, and the uh, $1,887 uh, uh, monthly rents, 65% uh, of the community could afford that. I think it's closer to the reverse. Basically, if you can afford a rent of $1,523, you're at 76% of median income, which is low income, and that uh, converts to an annual income of $60,000, roughly or $5,000, a little over $5,000 a month. Uh, I think low income is getting a bad rap here because people associate low income with people that are uh, below the poverty line, and in, in at least in Ventura County, it is a lot different. Um, 
at a median, if you're paying a rent of $1,887 a month, your annual income is in the neighborhood of uh, $75,500. Now, with respect to the 10.5% uh, of the 18 units, Ten, and uh, the Finch project, the 10 units in the Jensen project, and the two in the Ryder. Uh, we're talking about 30 families that are making uh, in the neighborhood of $60,000 a year. And I think there needs to be a, an understanding there uh, when people are attacking uh, with respect to what it is. Now, with respect to uh, just on the, just this is more for the uh, developers. Uh, if they're uh, there was a section in there in, about in lieu. It does sound like the developers are going to bring forward the uh, housing, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, but the figure in there about uh, affordable to low income of a $331,500 home price, uh, from my experience, that's uh, way out, way off base. We're talking more like 199 to 205 uh, is what people can afford based on uh, based on. Um, Paying, you know, their their homeowner and uh, rent, and I'd rather the mortgage, the insurance, taxes, and all of that. Now, I think the issue for this, I was very impressed with this project, and I, I think I sat in some meetings uh, a couple of years ago or whenever that was. So it has it has evolved into a really nice project, and I think there is a tremendous benefit uh, that they are going to be providing the whole community with parks. Parks is an issue everywhere. I think. Um, uh, the gentleman that spoke before me, uh, I didn't catch his name, the um, uh, retired policeman or the, the business owner slash uh, former policeman, he is absolutely right in terms of you've you got to keep children, you got to give children opportunities to do things. And um, what is important about low-income restricted housing whether you're talking about uh, farmer care housing that Cabrillo's doing or the housing that be included in here is you are providing people an opportunity to have some disposable income. Uh, when people are paying uh, rents or mortgages that are within their means, then yes, they have money to be able to spend. And I'll tell you, people that are not as affluent are those that are more likely to spend the majority of their disposable income in their immediate community. So whether we're talking about from the Cabrillo project, whether we're talking about low income within this project, you have much better opportunity to bring local business being supported by people in your community because the people do spend their money there. Uh, so I think that's something that people need to, to think about. Uh, you know, with respect to the Belarus, uh, I do have some experience in that, particularly with the River Park Project in Oxnard. Um, there's a whole host of problems with Belarus. Uh, probably the, the biggest one is the, the increase in property taxes. Uh, you know, you're saying it's $20 a month. Uh, well, if you're talking about a family raising children and they want to do Little League and they have uh, expenses for the kids for school. Twenty dollars a month may not seem like a lot of money, but in terms of it may be the difference between the kid getting to play little league or not. Uh, and this is regardless of regardless of the income of the people in these homes. It gets really tight. Uh, with respect to the shot in the arm for the county and in, and the community's ability to demand more uh, uh, police services in the neighborhood. Uh, one gentleman was up here and said that I think he, he thought, you know, people had lived in the neighborhood a long time and maybe their assessed value is in the neighborhood of $20,000 on their homes. And, and you consider the uh, amount of taxes that generates as compared to what I think the figure was like a $400,000 home. The amount of taxes that is going to generate is astronomical in comparison. And... Um, you know, I would hope that the way this community is proposed and the incomes that they're going to be serving and the tax base that is going to be increased in this community, that uh, police services should not be an issue. You should be able to serve it based on the property taxes that they're generating. And I think it's very short-sighted if you're going to have already a homeowners association 
that is actually going to, probably the primary thing that Homeowners Association is going to be supporting is a public park. That is a huge benefit, a huge benefit for the entire Piru community. And I think to go beyond that and try to create a mellow ruse so that you can support half a sheriff, I think that's really short-sighted. And my experience with respect to mellow ruse is, okay, the, the CFD, there are two CFDs in, in Oxnard, one of them in the, in the River Park project. One of them is specifically related to the schools. That money goes straight to schools. Uh, one is for the, um, the streets, repairs and landscape and all of that. Things that you can actually tie down and say this is directly going. I think with Sheriff, you really, it, it's probably unworkable. But in the overall scheme of things, I think you've got to look at your total project. What is it getting? What are going to be the expenses of the people that live in this project? What is going to be the, their ability to have some disposable income to participate in the, pro, in the community, number one, and number two, to be able to finance Little League for their kids, to be able to uh, finance their kids with respect to schools? And I just want to say one quick thing on schools, and particular with respect to the, the Farm Worker Project, just to kind of clear the air a little bit. When you put people in housing, that is appropriate sized. You see, one of the biggest benefits we've seen with, with the affordable housing, and particularly with the farm care housing, is where you place people where their kids have a, a place to study and an opportunity to participate usually in these kinds of uh, uh, housing. There's availability of computers. What we have seen is that the school participation and educational progress of these kids just, it skyrockets. And so I think we need not to look with tunnel vision here. We need to look at the whole thing. You've got a great project, and I think that uh, you're on the right track. And let's, let's not go forward with any misconceptions, and let's not, let's not make it unaffordable to the folks any more than you have to so that they can have some money to spend in their community. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Mel Stitch. I'm a resident of Piru, and I've been asked by Janet Bergamo, the president of the Piru Neighborhood Council, to read this letter to you today, the Ventura County Planning Commission. The letter does not necessarily reflect my opinion, and I will read it as written. Mr. Stitch? Yes, sir. Just so you're aware, we have the letter. And yes. So for you to read it into the record is, at this point, redundant. Is it? Yes. Okay. It, I was requested by Janet I, I to read the letter. The, so the letter, the letter I is, would like to read is it in the record. She asked me to do it. That's fine. At least. That's okay. Fine. Okay. Thank you. This is from the Piru Neighborhood Council, PO Box 382, Piru, California, <clears throat> 93040, to the Ventura County Planning Commission, Ventura County Government Center, 800 South Victoria Avenue, Ventura, California, 93009. Regarding the focused area update to the Piru Area Plan, 5 November 2008. Dear Commissioners, the representatives of the Piru community thank the Chair and the members of the, Piru, of the Planning Committee for the opportunity to comment on the enormous changes that have been proposed for the Piru area. <clears throat> we thank the Planning Department for many years of attention to this issue, and we thank the developers who have made efforts to address the concerns of Piru citizens, the special housing needs of our citizens, and our hope of retaining some of the rural charm that has drawn non-native citizens to Piru. Due to the inability of current members of the Piru Neighborhood Council Board to attend this meeting, as an interested citizen, I have been asked by PNC Board President Janet Bergamo to speak on behalf of the Piru community. We are aware of the pressure for housing, particularly low-income dwellings, that the state of California puts on every city and unincorporated area. We are willing to do our part to solve the housing crisis in the unincorporated areas of, of Ventura County. <clears throat> the ever-expanding document known as the Focused Area Update to the Piru Area Plan stands a bit above two inches tall when lying flat on a table, not including the half-inch stack of projected maps. Any document of such size, such a size, produces over a number of years produced over a number of years is likely to contain some flaws. 
Some of these have already been noted in the Piru Neighborhood Council's response to the first of many documents and updates. These appear on page 718, labeled Letter 15. The responses from the writers who wrote the document do not necessarily improve the accuracy of the document. They are the expected product of the California Environmental Quality Act, which provides benchmarks for quality projects, but no funding for review of proposals by disinterested parties. The above study was, of course, funded by developers with reluctant participation by supporters of our RDA. On page 1015 is a document from the erstwhile Piru Planning Commission that expresses unwavering opposition to four housing projects that depend on a fifth housing project to cover the low income housing percentage required, assuming an in lieu fee can be paid. It is the impression of at least one developer who monitors this process closely that the PNC should reverse the comments detailed on page 1015. If the minor modifications made by the four developers truly change the effect of the approximate 75% increase in Piru's population, the PNC has already stated a willingness to reverse the unwavering opposition stance. We need some housing in Piru, but the concerns remain unchanged and unaddressed or irresolvable due to state pressures on Ventura County. The problem is really that the SOAR ordinance boundaries for the Piru area were and was as was the ordinance hastily crafted. No Pyruvians were, present, were present at the meeting that omitted 60 plus acres of prime agricultural land from SOAR from the future special needs of the Piru community. There are definite housing needs in Piru for locally employed residents or those who might be employed locally in the near future. The PNC doubts there would be more than 100 families in need of housing in the next 10 years given an area with no more than a dozen employers. There, this is no surprise. Therefore, whose special needs from the original EIR on the project, quoting the SOAR ordinance, will be served by the projects as proposed? The fact that a crowd of Pyruvians is not present at this meeting does not mean that no one is concerned. It might suggest to commissioners that the residents of our community are either struggling to survive as families and cannot attend meetings during the workday, or wondering how to recover their investment and get out of town, as has more than half of the original Citrus View development residents. When confronted by a massive tome such as a focused area plan update, it is tempting to listen to the Piru community's willingness to bear a fair share of the housing burden mandated by the state. The analysis of the professionals in the planning department and the earnest rhetoric of the developers. It makes tremendous sense to do the quickest and easiest thing, recommend approval of the projects as proposed. From the vantage point of 100% of the people who have studied the project and can recommend approval, the proposals look benign. Please consider those of you who take tomes to lunch and actually highlight concerns that the original Pyra, Pyru Area Plan Update Committee never completed its update. We were told that funding had been consumed. Next, a special series of meetings was held to analyze the character of existing assessments which the members of the update plan committee already opposed. When cosmetic aspects of the opposed development were subject to vote, please be advised that the developers were given equal votes with residents because they had interests in the Piru community. Some Pyruvians therefore believe that the charrette process touted in the EIR was in fact a charade. The county of Ventura needs housing in the unincorporated area particularly the low income. Piru Neighborhood Council members acknowledge and hope to satisfy the community's fair share of housing needs. We, the community of Piru, also respectfully request that the Planning Commission consider the concept of environmental justice as expressed in the most recent revision of the State of California General Plan Guidelines. What kind of environment will the proposed developments create in the community of Piru? What will 
happen to, at the elementary school? How many breaking and entering crimes must be committed? How many drug buys must occur? How many services must be tagged before funding for law enforcement will be provided? Please don't tell us that if we build it, the amenities will come to Piru. Citrus View and Calista, Colina Vista were built, and we lost our sheriff substation. The school requires more improvements than developers can realistically provide. Given the lack of infrastructure along Main Street, which will be so costly that the number of homes cannot be reduced, the developers say. Do you see a floodplain anywhere on the project maps? What will infill really protect the east side of Piru Creek spills its banks? Our evacuation from the east side of Piru the winter of 2005 was not a reaction to a, pre a perceived danger per the original EIR. It was mandated by Ventura County Search and Rescue. If you have been blessed with the time to read the entire EIR comments and various addenda, no more need to be said. Would you be comfortable living in the proposed development? Are any of the mitigations more than paper solutions? Will the projects be approved because there is not the will or the funding to modify SOAR? Are the product, projects just, fair, and right for the area in which they are proposed? Where are the environmental and economic justice principles per the state general plan guidelines served in the project propo proposed? Does it seem interesting that no one involved in writing of the SOAR ordinance, none of the planning done on behalf of Piru by Ventura County employees, no one involved in the review of the documents, no one involved in the decision-making process lives within eight miles of Piru? Is this how environmental justice looks in practice? Yes, give us the housing we need. Give us what our environment, our community can safely survive. The environment in Piru is already to toxic. Respectively submitted Janet Bergamo, President, Piru Neighborhood Council, with CCs all around. Would you like to leave our bike path and walk Piru at dark now? Would you like to buy one of the cute houses on Main Street in Piru and watch the traffic cl clog? and see the accidents created by new residents on the east side trying to turn left to exit Piru on Main Street at a traffic calming intersection. We try in Piru to do our part, but we wonder about county support. The hastily crafted SOAR ordinance handicaps many communities. It's so much easier to appreciate and effuse about Piru's willingness to take its share, but with a median income 21000 what is Piru share? Environmental justice include economic injustice. Despite the earnest efforts of many people, the projects are unjust in most senses of the word. Environmental and economic justice, yes, those of us who cannot attend are shouting at you. That includes Piruvians who know we need some housing and are too overcommitted to point out that a bus turnout does nothing to mitigate traffic until there is a bus. Respectfully yours, Janet Bergamo, President, Piru Neighborhood Council. Thank you very much. I have no more speaker cards. We come now to, uh, yes, go ahead. Mr. Chair, may I have a question? I have a question. I understand that the principal of Piru Elementary is here, and I he, wonder if that He actually had to leave. Thank yeah. you. I saw that happen, too. Um, there, there are some specific concerns um, raised in this letter that um, I would like to have staff respond to. Just in terms of, but before staff responds, um, do the applicants have any rebuttal? Don't all leap up at once, Eric. You're not a stat. You're not an applicant, Jim. Yeah, I just come and say who you are and rebut what you need to rebut. I still am Jim Finch. And I would like to, it, it's often in other meetings, the SOAR exemption has been pointed out. And I would like to point out that there were areas around Ventura and Oxnard and other communities 
they weren't exempt from the county. The lines were drawn so that there was still room. I think every community was left room to grow. So this was nothing out of the normal. Within Venturas, there were areas left. So I don't think that that is so unique, percentage-wise or you know, ratio-wise, who knows? I haven't done. The other thing that I'd like to point out that I failed to point out in mine, and unfortunately the diagrams that were put on the screens didn't show it, but from the southwest, yes, southwest corner of my project, there will be a new uh, southbound road that connects to Pacific Avenue, which will allow for a third exit point to Piru whereas there's currently two with uh, Main Street and Center Street, this will allow a third one. And just to follow up with that, I am aware of that. How is that? Will that be a right turn only? Well, they could turn either way onto Pacific Avenue, but if they go left, um, the eastern end of Pacific is right turn only. So you can only go west from the east side, and from the west side you can go either way. Thank you. So it, it does address the access issue, is why I rebutted that. Any other rebuttal? Mr. Cohen. Um, just to clarify the bus issue, um, there's the Fillmore Unified School District, there's Vista and FATCO that uh, service that are daily in Piru. I can call the Fillmore Unified School District and they will come and pick me up at my home? There's <laughs> bus service in Piru. <laughs> For school. For school, thanks. Yes. Mr. Ryder? Okay. Mr. Johnson? Staff? Right. With regard to environmental justice, uh, that, that section of, uh, of CEQA talks about dividing an existing neighborhood, uh, existing community in two or what else? What's the uh, most recent revision? And how does it pertain to this project? This project has been designed to work with the Piru community. There are pathways that lead north that the community is designed to, to be an entryway to the community. It's one of the, the recommendations of the Piru Area Plan Update Committee was not to create a divisive us versus them kind of situation. And I think we tried to do that in our planning. Uh, although there will be differences between the two, if you want to call them two separate communities, one will be new money, new new, uh, new blood, if you would. Uh, the other will be folks that have been there for, for much longer. Do you think there is, uh, uh, is does the EIR uh, address environmental justice issues? Not Was directly. it raised during the review process at all? Not it's directly. Not there were some issues issue. with respect to uh, community character, but not uh, environmental justice. I'm sorry, did you say it wasn't it's, in the EIR? Yeah, it's not part of the EIR issue. It's part of the general plan guidelines. It sounds like the sequel guidelines um, it document that the state, I believe, put out last year. Right. Okay, I'm, ju I'm not familiar with what it is. So uh, um, I read it a long time ago. I don't remember exactly uh, the this discussion. But it, I, I was just pointing out it wasn't part of this, the sequel <coughs> process, that's all. It should, should it have been part of the sequel process? Yeah. Uh, no. Okay. Well, can, can only in relationship to a general plan. That's where environmental justice and then the division of the community. Then there there would be the way my understanding of sequel. Then then there would be an environmental justice issue. Not not in the context of sequel. It can certainly be an issue of discussion as part of this hearing. But it's not a CEQA issue. It is just simply one of the factors that your commission would consider in looking at the proposal. Uh, and as Dennis pointed out, uh, the concept is would the new development, and this is not just the type of development we have here, but there was concern, especially in the LA area, that they were citing um, some fairly significant recycling centers in the lower income communities. And that's where it really started and it grew to this, this other issue of, of, well wait, don't use this as the 
dumping ground for these locally undesirable land uses. The question, the question here is, as Dennis or Dennis tried to respond, the physical design of these small neighborhoods um, are meant to connect with the rest of the community, not divide it. So from a physical standpoint, we believe that it is not exacerbating an environmental injustice. The question that the community had <coughs> with regard to uh, Piru and its role in meeting the county unincorporated areas need for uh, lower income housing. They have felt and they have stated that they felt that they are lower income compared to the rest of the county. They've had quite a few projects in the past and quite frankly if you ask them I think they would fairly say we don't want any more. On the other hand, they understand that it's not always that black and white. And so you have some in the community who feel there's still too much associated and others in the community that probably think, well, this is probably a reasonable compromise. I can't speak for them individually. You'll have to take that as part of the record. But I think that's the context in which this is being preferred by Ms. Bergamo, but of course uh, she's not here to answer, to answer any questions of clarification of what she intended by well, that. Well, I want to make sure that this letter just isn't read for 10 minutes of our time and that the questions are not uh, uh, answered, at least uh, the best to the best of our ability. Uh, the next point in the letter that I think needs answering is uh, regarding impacts to the elementary school. And then to, uh, in, the same, in the same paragraph it talks about the uh, the need for law enforcement, but could you focus on the uh, elementary school for a moment? Certainly. Um, the school district is Fillmore Unified School District. They maintain a, an elementary school, K through five, I think, in Piru on Center Street. Uh, the school, at the time the EIR was written, was nearly at capacity. It, I think there was room for 75 more students. Since that time, uh, Fillmore Unified has constructed some new schools in the city of Fillmore and a lot of the students that had been bused to Piru were moved back to Fillmore schools and so there is more room within the school than there was at the time that the EIR was originally written. That's discussed in the EIR update. Um, but the net result is the, the all three projects approved, it will exceed the capacity of, of Piru school. The school district wrote us a letter saying that uh, they would accommodate that by relocating the uh, students that come out of the CESPI farm worker housing project, which is located about two miles west of the community of Piru. Those students would be sent to Fillmore schools. And if necessary, they would replace some of the one-story portable units on the campus with two-story units. And they said they could do that with the money that they would receive from school fees that would be paid by these developers. So with with those mitigation measures that the school district would be responsible for, they say that they can adequately accommodate the educational needs of the community. Okay, looking through it, she talks about uh, Piru Creek and spilling. Can you talk about um, mandatory evacuation of these areas if it was necessary? Well, there was a, a flood in 2002, I think is, is what she was referring to, when there was some um, flooding uh, that occurred and, and more that was threatened. There was a concern that the Piru Dam would overtop and create a real problem. Uh, there was a voluntary evacuation, not a mandatory one as I understand it, to Piru Elementary School, which is high ground for the community and a designated uh, emergency shelter for the, for the community for flooding issues. Uh, according to Janet Bergamo, there was uh, about 600 people that relocated for a day or two uh, high ground while the flood situation was, was threatening. Um, she said that was taxing uh, the school's ability to provide shelter services. This, the uh, Red Cross indicates the school has the capability of, of handling between 600 and 900 evacuees. Um, the proposed projects are, as, as your testimony earlier, are within the, currently within the 100-year flood fringe area. Uh, the development of the project would involve uh, 
uh, grading and, and fill that would, is supposed to bring the project above that uh, line and, and take it out of the flood zone. But if the, the new projects also evacuated that would add to the, to the uh, number of residents that would evacuate to Piru School, under the Red Cross standards, the school would be adequate to accommodate the, the evacuation. Under the uh, situation that uh, Ms. Bergamo pointed out in 2002, she said if the same rate of evacuation occurred for the new development uh, as it did for the community in 2002, the school would be at or just, just beyond capacity. Uh, and I think that was the issue that she was raising. I think she, yeah. Uh, just one point of clarification. I believe it's 2005 as opposed yeah. to 2002. Okay. Recently. Um, other two points raised in her letter have to do with the median income and in, in Piru being um, 21,000. Is is that a correct uh, figure? I don't know what the median income is today. Based on the 2000 census, uh -huh. a number of years back, it was, I think as reported, about 50% less than the countywide average, it was significantly less. And then uh, SOAR guidelines. Um, SOAR was a voter initiative. Correct. And it was based on the Greenbelt agreements that the uh, cities had and uh, created city urban restrictions, uh, boundaries. Uh, what was the county's part in in uh, the SOAR ordinance? First, you understand that there were multiple SOAR ordinances. Multiple uh, there were SOAR ordinances. There was countywide. Yeah, maybe and eight or ten of them. Yeah, all the right. different and, cities. And, and each of the cities adopted a SOAR ordinance with a curb boundary that said, here you can develop, here you can't, uh, without a vote of the people within that city. Uh, for the county, um, there is no curb boundary because the county is not a city. Uh, but they created effectively a, a curb boundary around Piru. Uh, with the idea that that it might be necessary at some point to allow for expansion of that community to meet the, I think the words of the floor and say, to meet the special needs of that community and to give the board the flexibility to deal with it. And was it, I, I don't remember what year that, that SOAR vote was, but, 1998. but it was passed? Yes. Uh, Could you also answer the community uh, facilities development and, and how that those monies can be focused in Piru because I think that was the uh, stated opposition to the Melrose. My understanding is if a Melrose Community Facilities District was created, it would generate money that would go to the Sheriff's Department, but they would, and, and County Council may contradict me here, but I believe they'd be required to spend the money in the area where the money was, was raised. And last, um, the downstream impacts from from raising the the uh, site up three feet. What happens downstream? What happens if Piru overfills its banks? What happens downstream? Well, Piru Creek. There's no development south of Highway 126. It flows into uh, Santa Clara River and becomes a a small part of a much larger stream. So are there any impacts from from raising this thing up? Uh, I guess technically you could say that if you took an area out of where the area would, would flow, where water would flow, then you're moving that impact someplace else, but it would be minuscule in terms of the impact elsewhere because you're talking about a very large area. It's not like if you raise one area, the other side of town's going to flood. That doesn't work in this case. But... If, if I could remind you, I think the testimony that you heard from Public Works is they're hoping to, to, to redraw the map to say that it's not in the flood zone in the first place, in which case there would be no water diverted. Thank you very much. Certainly. Are there other questions? I do have... Yeah. I, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go. I do have... I was presented some information that purports to be um, U.S. Census Bureau fact finder sheet when this appears to report that in 1999 dollars the median household income uh, was 41,000 
uh, approximately 41,100 per household. Median. median. That's the median. That's the midpoint. Yeah, just a just a trailer to to Commissioner Dukas's uh, comments and questions and your comments about uh, about the floodplain, etc. Uh, what impact is is raising the reader properties elevation three and a half feet, according to what was stated, going to have an impact down street um, on as far as it relates to the habitat for humanity adjacent property, uh, primarily and obviously uh, further down uh, the Jensen. Cohen property. Primarily. The habitat project was also raised out of the flood zone when the wet project was developed, as I understand it. The, the, the same, the same laws, same rules under public works were still in play. So the reader property then, in this process, if it moves forward, will bring that property up to grade with the property Should. that habitat presently has. Presumably. Thank you. Well, the also the uh, the drainage has to be designed such as to convey uh, the increase impervious or the increase of runoff um, and they also have within the design retention facilities that impedes the water so that it goes in off peak hours and they have to size, they have to do all the engineering and size the conveyance pipes and drainage so as not to adversely impact downstream properties the water coming out of the project can't exceed the pre-project development quantity of water during the peak hour, yes. I always like it when we mix traffic language with water language. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, anything else, Dennis? Uh, not unless your commission has further questions. Okay. Just to sort of frame this, I would, I'd like to move to a decision. Uh, there are a couple of us who are very constrained for time. We've had closing comments by staff. I would at this point close the public hearing and turn it over to the commission. It's, uh, it, we have a situation where the, the developer is asking that we not uh, make one of the recommendations regarding the Melarus and the CDF. Um, but it's but it's staff recommendation staff's recommendation to us that we do uh, I can't get the exact uh, wording here recommend approval of the Melarus yeah, of, the, of these things yeah of the Melarus so um, is this something that's going to get appealed to the board or does it have to go to the board anyway to uh, this uh, presuming you would uh, go along with the recommended action to defer the RPD permit decision to the board this is going to all go up to the board. Uh, the board will then be faced with the policy decision of whether or not to adopt the Melarus as a mitigation measure to offset the uh, law enforcement impacts. Alternatively, uh, if, if they were to be able to support it, they could perhaps adopt a statement of overriding considerations and deem it an unavoidable impact. Perhaps they will be able to uh, fund the position through the general fund or some other mechanism. But as it stands uh, today, the IR has deemed the loss of, uh, law enforcement issue a uh, significant impact, and the proposed mitigation measure is the Melarus to, to fund the half a police officer. Okay. Um, well, I think, uh, I think it's, it's needed based on the testimony that we have here and just my general knowledge of the area. So um, it's not something that I'd be interested in dropping just for informational purposes for this. If I, yeah, I, I, I believe at this point, as, a, as the technical body, as the technical body, I think we need to take the testimony as a person, I think relying on private Melarusing is silly. I think it, it potentially bankrupts projects, but that is not as a policy statement I don't think it's appropriate for we as the Planning Commission to take a position on that. But uh, so I, I see you're talking about item J on page 67 of the staff report. Um, we are recommending that the board authorize council. I mean, all of this is couched in the language of recommendation. 
so on 67, we're, we are we would be adopting uh, a recommended action that would would recommend to the board that they authorize uh, the use of Melrose, but the board in fact has to take this up. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I. So we're, in we're we're absolutely. In okay. Um, well, are there any other uh, comments? Before we well, I have a comment, and Pyru was created as a utopian community. I think Mr. Cook would be sort of spinning around at this point, um, but. No matter what we do, uh, this is a change event for Pyru. Uh, Pyru has been was badly damaged in '94. Really has never recovered. Um, I do miss the bluebird. <laughs> I know. <So> do we. <laughs> At times, but given all of that, uh, it's it's time to. Uh, I don't uh, I don't envy Pyru because there is some real destruction that's occurred within the community and within the community dialogue. And quite frankly, I expect you all to put it back together and remember how to talk to each other. Having said that, the recommendation we're making today isn't going to help. So um, welcome to the game. But having said that, I, I really think we need to move this to the board. Yeah, I do. Um, are we doing a, 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 a we're discussing? Okay. Um, yeah, I do have a couple of comments. Um, I don't agree. I don't feel comfortable with Miller as, as a source of funding either. Um, and in my previous life, as I, I, I commented earlier, um, you know, I've, I've put these things together. I've put the methodology together. I've administered the budget. I've, d I've sat for over 15 years uh, on the sure side of the table um, every year dealing with the CEO to understand and have a grasp of how funding occurs and how what happens. And then when you think you've got a deal, um, the numbers change and you find yourself with an additional half a million dollars in revenue obligation uh, just to make it fit in the overall county budget and somehow, some way, you as a department would have to find a way to either generate that money or cut your costs to, to mitigate that additional responsibility. Um, the $189,000 is, is, uh, is a significant amount and the reason I don't uh, like uh, Melarus uh, and I realize the board can't make, a, a, can't make uh, the decision or comment individually, but uh, the reason is um, you're chasing a figure that's going to change every year. Um, the staff report indicates um, an inflation factor uh, should be calculated with approximately 4% on staffing costs. What I f and that's true. Uh, there is an inflation cost. Um, I don't agree that it's 4%. I think uh, having to administer these, these issues, cost issues, and, and knowing the, the sheriff's position on these issues, there is extreme effort made to control cost and, and keep it uh, keep it um, in the three percent range if in fact it increases and the primary reason for those increases we usually have to do with, with labor the regulated issues um, um, what this hundred eighty nine thousand dollar cost that's identified in the staff report also does not does not uh, identify is startup cost uh, to put an officer out there um, that would in essence uh, become available if the board followed the Melarus uh, uh, recommendation authorized it. They would become available uh, to give the, the community 40 hours of, of uh, the equivalent of 40 hours of, of time per week. Um, there's approximately $35,000 of additional cost based on my experience and based on the, on the information I received uh, uh, from the Sheriff's Business Office. It's a one, uh, it's a one time only cost in the, init in the initial year uh, for the acquisition of a vehicle, which is by today's budget number is twenty-three thousand uh, dollars, there's an additional cost of about eight thousand dollars to to outfit that vehicle with computers and electronics necessary. Um, that's a one-time cost. Uh, there's an ongoing cost with vehicles of about uh, um, twenty-eight hundred dollars per year for monthly maintenance plus uh, twenty-one cents a mile um, mileage cost. That would be an ongoing cost uh, along with the staffing cost. 
Um, so after the first year, there'd be re there'd be elimination of the acquisition of a vehicle and the computer cost. Um, but that is something that's not identified here. Um, my first uh, exposure to these issues in Melarus goes back probably to about '85, when uh, when I was in research and planning, and it was approached by the Amundsen Group to deal with uh, the potential issue that we know has been resolved in the east end of the county. Um, little did I know then that the numbers I gave them then um, really would sit dormant for a great number of years to be incorporated in the EIR. Um, that's why I'm particularly sensitive to these issues and aware of these issues um, and why I don't think Melarus personally is the way to go with this thing. Um, I know how to solve it. I mean, quite honestly. There is uh, approximately $99,000 of property tax plus additional tax revenue is going to be generated by this proposal, these three parcels that build out. My suggestion, uh, if I were to speak to the board or a board member, would be to direct the CEO to allocate the allocation and the appropriate funding that would generate from the development uh, and give the sheriff the allocation, um, even though it might be half funding. Um, and I suspect well, I know, knowing, knowing the way the organization works and having been in the position of decision-making on it, that um, if they've got the allocation, uh, they'll find a way to, to put those services out there to supplement uh, limited services right now. Uh, the, the issue of patrol services for Piru um, uh, as an unincorporated area um, is sparse. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, argue with that. And I'm not surprised, uh, Mr. Nauman, uh, knows that uh, that um, you're not happy with the service level out there. I wouldn't be either. Um, that's based on staffing, countywide staffing ratio of one per 1,270,000 pe 700 people. Um, just a point of clarification: uh, there are two patrol areas there. Uh, one goes. Uh, uh, and covers everything from Fillmore towards Santa Paula, uh, basically out to the Todd Road area. Um, both sides of the river goes up into the Santa Paula Canyon, Upper Ojai area. Um, the second area, which is the primary focus for Piru, uh, basically is everything east, uh, the Bargedale area, to the LA County line, up the, up the canyon to Piru, etc. That's, that's the service level that you're dealing with. Um, and I, I I'm not surprised by the comments that it's basically a drive-through. I am heartened by the fact that uh, in conversation um, earlier this week and last week with Captain Hagel, that he's found some creative ways to ad try to address some of the issues of the community um, as a result of the community services officer's uh, uh, removal uh, from, that, from that station due to budget cuts several years ago. Um, however, it's not practical on a long-term basis. And in essence, uh, I think he said that last year, maybe it was this year, um, he addressed the issue by uh, putting an additional person out there uh, about mid-June through mid-September uh, for a dedicated number of hours to address weekend-type situations where there, you have an intensity of, of ingress and egress from the public into the area. And when most communities uh, uh, tend to have a few problems, Unfortunately, that's an overtime situation um, that is nebulous at best, um, and it doesn't work. Um, uh, it's subject that funding is subject to to curtailment uh, as part of the budget process. Um, the benefit of what he did, uh, what he, and I've done the same thing. I've administered Contract City a Community. I, I ran the city of Moore Park for three years. And so I know about budget and budget uh, funding and shifting of costs and shifting of uh, funding resources and reallocating over time. Um, uh, the benefit uh, is that he was able to do it at the beginning of the fiscal year, um, which begins July 1. And so if you start, if you opt to create uh, uh, extra patrol, for lack of a better description, in a community, in an area, July 15th, it's not going to hit the books until after, you hit, after July. Um, and so you have the maximum flexibility to address the issue. But I think, uh, I think if the board were to, were to, were encouraged to, to uh, have the CAO, CEO allocate 
the FTE, full-time equivalent of a deputy, specifically for the area out of that station. Um, and obviously there's property going to, property taxes are going to be generated by a plus sales tax. That would, uh, although it wouldn't fully fund it, it would have a major impact of, on it. And I think the residual would be uh, uh, some additional presence um, by a deputy in the community of Fillmore. Excuse can me, we, in the community of Piru. Can we, can we get uh, uh, staff to respond to that suggestion and see, see how doable this is? No, go ahead. Is that? I just want to point out one thing. If you look at page uh, 24 of the staff report, the calculation ha already has included in the estimated tax revenue of, uh, what is it, 99000 and reduced it. The calculation was based on 189,000 for the sheriff. 91% um, would be caused by the development, reducing it to 171.9, and then subtracted the expected property tax and sales tax revenue of 99,000, leaving uh, the, the deficit is 72,000, and that's what's presently being funded by the Melrose. Um, it's, it's not the 189,000; it's only 72,000. Um, that, that is the subject of the Mellow So, I mean, if, if I think your suggestion would be more, more directed towards the CEO trying to find a half a half time FTE the, that's to, they, to eliminate the need for the Mellow so Roos, if, if, the, if the, they can come up with a half of a police officer. Could the could the audience keep it down? It it really is disruptive up here. We're trying to have a conversation. Thanks. Sorry. Um, so I was just pointing that out to clarify that. The deficit seventy two thousand six hundred, and the recommendation, as I understand what you were saying, Commissioner Rodriguez, then would be to have the CEO look to see if they can find a half time position because we've already considered sales tax revenue in the in the calculation of what the Mueller risk would be. You're correct. I mean, I, I'm speaking specifically to a potential deficit of approximately okay. seventy-two thousand dollars that would have to be found someplace. And my comment is that that uh, uh, by authorizing the the allocation, the FTE, uh, with the available funding that would that would uh, that would carry with that uh, with the development that would be generated by the development uh, on the table, um, the deficit would be seventy-two odd thousand. Um, but the allocation is what, is what physically has to be available to put physically put someone someone in the field. And I realize there's an ongoing vacancy factor. It's part of the nature of the business. And I think when the report it talked about the number of sheriff's allocations that presently exist um, and the number of vacancies, um, I think it commented about 81 department wide. And that's that's not surprising. But it's part of the attrition process. It's ongoing year round. Um, Anyway, I think uh, I think if the if the board considered that as a viable option, if in fact they choose not to follow Melrose uh, as a funding source, uh, I think that has the potential to address what the community is looking for here. It addresses the developer's concerns, I believe, and it certainly um, leaves the sheriff's department with a with an additional staff person, although not fully funded. Certainly not with a li potential liability of one hundred eighty-nine thousand dollars. May I make a comment here? I, I think the Piru community deserves a full-time sheriff's deputy, and I think it's the responsibility of the board to find out a way to fund that. And I'm opposed to Melarus too, so I'd like to recommend that we just make that recommendation that okay. that they do it and okay, figure out a way without Melarus. Let's let me. Let me propose language then, given what I'm hearing, and that is to modify the recommendation J to authorize that the board authorize full-time equivalent coverage via policy, period. Fine. Bruce is shaking his head like, I can't do that. No, the, the point is, is that there has to be a funding source commitment, or otherwise the board to say, this is an unfunded 
need and for which the EIR currently concludes that that's a significant effect. The board can approve that if they adopt overriding considerations, but they can't just deal with this as uh, in in the it's perhaps the the uh, wording you suggested. You may, however, change that same recommendation to substitute a different funding, an assured funding source as may be determined by the board of supervisors. I love that. You can that. substitute that. The man's language. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? I'll second. We, what we just did was we, just, uh, just on, the on J, so it's the recommended actions. Okay. Bruce, say it again. Can you say it again? Well, I want to make sure page that we're looking page, at the same. Page 67. Page 67. J, on page 67, authorize the use of a Mallow Roos facilities district or other assured funding sources determined by the board as a method of funding long-term enforcement, enhanced uh, law or enforcement. Or you could say you recommend um, the board find, find an alternative source of funding oh, if the fill in, um, for the, the long-term enhanced law enforcement of, of Piru, or if that is unavailable, then recommend the authorization of the Mellow Roos. So you're, so you're kind of laying out the priority, that your first priority is that they find alternative funding. And if not, then we do go ahead and recommend the Mellow Roos. And, and then that will meet the, uh, the CEQA? Right. Okay. Yeah, then we still have a, a, a mitigated impact. Okay. If we don't have funding, then we, we, we go into an unmitigated impact, and that's when we get into statement of overriding considerations, which means no police officer. So... I think you're, you're just stating your priority, if I understand it correctly. Your priority is let's find another source of funding, and then if not, then the board should consider the Mellow Roos, which they, or may, they may or may not find is a good option anyway. Well, there's an identified source of funding in the staff report, that $99,000, which is property tax and sales tax. Uh, my, my, uh, my comment right. is, is to uh, prioritize, the, the, prioritize the use of that fund, and you do that by... Uh, recommending that the board authorize an additional FTE or deputy allocation uh, to make use of that funding that's generated by the by the proposals uh, that are on the table today. Otherwise, as, as the applicants have stated, uh, those uh, sales tax revenues and property tax revenues go into the general fund and basically disappear into the black hole. Um, and well, I, I don't know that you have to get into that detail. You can just say you recommend that they fund a full-time uh, position, however they accomplish that. Okay, uh, let me let me jump I, in. I know we're pressed for time, but this is really no, important. No, let me, I, I agree. Say what you just said off mic. <laughs> uh, is this within the purview of the board to direct the sheriff where to uh, spend money, or is it within the purview of the board to direct the uh, CAO to say this is, you know, where how the money is going to be allocated? Because I remember there were certain things that the board was blamed for that the sheriff did that wasn't within their control at all. That's essentially correct. the The board does is the final determining body as to budget, but the sheriff, who's a separate elected official, determines where those funds are actually allocated within his, within his um, authority. Now, with certain contractual agencies like cities, there is an actual contract, so there is a, a, a much more direct link. Um, I don't know, perhaps this is a question for uh, our council as to um, does the board have the authority to, let's say, allocate out of general fund with strings attached so that the sheriff has to do that or the funds go away? <laughs> I, I don't know of any mechanism that is so. Well, I don't know the answer to that question right off the top of the head. I, I, I mean, the bottom line is we're talking about mitigating an impact. That money has got to go for, to pay for sheriff and Piru. Um, 
certainly if it came from Belarus, it would have to be used for that. Yes. Um, I can't conceive of a, of, a, of a situation where the board specifically allocates funds for the purpose of funding a sheriff officer of Hyru, and then they don't do the sheriff doesn't do that. Um, I'd have to talk to someone else who's more familiar with the budgeting aspects. It's not something I'm, I'm really knowledgeable about. But at this point, as, here at the Planning Commission, I think you can you, we can state the recommendation is that you want to see a funded police officer um, in Piru. <coughs> Maybe we can say specifically, uh, obviously, uh, Commissioner Rodriguez is more knowledgeable about the budgeting aspects. I don't know if it's necessary. Maybe it is necessary to require the board or, or recommend that the board somehow dedicate that sales tax and property tax revenue towards um, the funding of that sheriff or just recommending that they somehow come up with a full-time position because if they don't then we don't have we're back from a CEQA standpoint at an unmitigated impact. Is there is there another way to get those funds besides the Mellow Roos and uh, this other pr you know preference? There's no other Well the sheriff or? doesn't have the sources. Oh. Uh, is there is there another way to mitigate those those impacts that are identified in the CEQA? I'm yeah there were some. We analyzed though. three different mechanisms two of which require a cent, a voter and cent, uh, a cent to special, sales or special, tax, special tax for the entire community. And given the financial situation of the community, that's, that's, that's not going to probably happen. Okay, so we are, left, we are left with this, and to our knowledge, that is the only other mechanism, other than the board saying, Board of Supervisors, out of the general fund, committing and then somehow getting a, a, an assurance from the sheriff's department that that extra money would in fact go to Pyro. I don't know of any other sources of funding that would uh, mitigate this this shortfall. Comment. Okay. You know okay. We we have limited authority here, and I think we need to acknowledge our limited authority. I think the record shows in the dialogue that we just had. If this motion passes, that there is, and the language that's been suggested, that item J is a little problematic, and there are specific recommendations about how that's dealt with. Okay, so we just need, uh, we were going to vote on amending J to that other language, and we never finished voting, so we should call for that vote on J. No, no, the motion was for the recommended action with the adjustment to the language of J as suggested, and then it was sort of bantered back and forth. So So he, he's made the motion already? To, to recommend approval with this, this specific change to J, putting Melarus as a second option. Is everyone, is that... That's, that's fine. I just want to be sure it's a full time, but I guess that's, that that goes without saying. So yes, let's let's go with let's go with that. Let's go with my motion. Do I have a second? I guess. Yes, and it has been seconded. Second. Okay, and, and and so we're clear. And the motion would include the recommendation that the, that the, the board, uh, by their authority or direction of CEO, um, allocate an additional FTE. Um, yes. For that uh, assigned to the area for that purpose. Yes. Just for, for my clarification, could I have exactly what the motion is on, on item J, exactly what the, what the language is? Item, so item J is changed to read, authorize the use of a Melrose Community Facilities District or other funding source for the commitment of a full-time FTE officer in Pyro. But you're not stating your priority. I, I'm sorry, and, and I apologize. Council was correct. The priority was switch it so that Melarus comes second. So the priority is... And also, if we could... Uh, I know we're pressed for time, so we don't have time fine. to go through all this, but also that's going to require some tweaking on the mitigation measures and the CEQA findings to accommodate. But the bottom line is... It, just one little quick point on this. The actual... Um, impact is the loss of a police officer and so that's what we're really focusing on now we're going to mitigate that impact by recommending a, a full-time officer 
The second aspect of it was the financing, which was more or less getting to how you apportion the cost attributable to developers. Right. So since we're getting away from that for now, that's not an important component of this as it is to recommend that they come up with a full-time FTE. In the alternative, then we recommend the formation of, an, of a Mellow Roos uh, district to in the... Yes. That's fine with my motion. I, I think I you got can it. word it out with them. You can listen to what you just said on the recording. It was very accurate. Any I other discussion? The last part about the, uh, as a method of funding the long-term enhanced law enforcement for the private community and fulfill the mitigation measures for Finch, Jensen, and Ryder projects. So I think we got it. Okay, and your, your motion, of course, also includes all of the additional exhibits that we received today. I'm in. And your second includes that. It does. Other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. I apologize. I need to excuse myself. There is a FEMA meeting across the hall. I, could you just adjourn? adjourn yeah. the Actually, meeting? we're going to lose our quorum. So um, two issues. One, I hope we're going to get together for lunch before Christmas, and uh, we'll figure that out. And after that, if there's nothing else, I would adjourn.